Awesome. Okay, so welcome to day two. The theme of the day are spins. Uh, and we have three speakers. I'm the first speaker. Margaret is the second speaker. And Daniel, who's already here, uh, come on, is the third speaker. And why can't I see? Oh, no. I cannot. Here, slideshow. Awesome. Okay, so today awesome. there's a lot to learn about. Oh, no, 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 no. About spins. Okay, and uh, why spins? Um, what are spins? Why are spins important? And I'm, I hope I'll have time to talk a little bit about how spins appear in the context of uh, quantum biology. Right. So we're still. Uh, I think that the, the thing that guides me uh, as I'm preparing those slides is the fact that, again, I think that quantum literacy is essential for you to understand the world that you already live in. It's not some weird futuristic world. Uh, there's a lot of technologies that depends on quantum mechanical phenomena. And I think we're here to discuss the extent to which nature might be using those same quantum mechanical phenomena to work and to work optimally. OK, so let's dive right in and let's talk about the definition of spin. Okay. So um, I like to think of spin as a uh, fundamental uh, extra degree of freedom of quantum objects. For example, right, let's let's talk about degree of freedom. Um, if you have an electron, an electron, say, in a nanomaterial, if it's put in a 3D box, it can move in three directions. If it's put in a 2D plane, it can move in two directions. And if it's put in a wire, it can only move in one direction. So here you see uh, three, two, and one degrees of freedom for movement of this electron. One simple analogy to think about spin is to think about spin as an extra degree of freedom, different from translational degrees of freedom, but a degree of freedom that has to do with interaction of a quantum object with magnetic fields. And we're going to talk a lot about this. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, analogies. Okay, So um, in the same way that, say, mass tells us how an object interacts with, with a gravitational field, charge tells us how an object interacts with an electric field, uh, spins are going to be related to how an object interacts with magnetic field. So using the analogy of charge, charges both create and interact with electric fields, as you can see here in this uh, top plot, and charges can be positive or negative. Similarly, spins both create and interact with magnetic fields. Uh, spins uh, don't have, so charges can be positive or negative. Spins can have different um, uh, particles with spin. Each, this spin property can have different magnitudes that I call uh, absolute value of S here. Okay. So uh, this again has to do with uh, how that property that quantum object interacts with magnetic fields, but uh, just as an abstraction, and that's one of the the hardest abstractions of the day. Uh, in, like charges can be positive or negative. Uh, we say that a spin with a magnitude s can have two s plus one allowed spin states. Sometimes people uh, draw those 2s plus 1 allowed spin states in, in a diagram such as the one to the right here, where there are different arrows, okay, uh, which again are just abstractions. There are rules on how to draw those things. Uh, but the, the important thing is that the number of allowed spin states is quantized, and the total number of allowed spin states has to do with the magnitude of the spin of that property called spin. For example, uh, to the right, you can see this very abstract representation of the allowed spin states for a spin of magnitude 2. 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5. You see five arrows here. Uh, it turns out, and this is when there is a magnetic field, for example, in this direction here. For example, electrons and protons have uh, a spin of magnitude 1 half. 
uh, in this sort of arrow diagram here, the representation of a spin one half is going to look like uh, the, the stuff to the right here. Okay, so I'm sure diagrams like this will appear, for example, in Daniel's talk. Um, so this is just one representation. So there are two available spin states if a spin has magnitude of one half. And you don't really have to, to, to grasp anything else uh, from this very abstract representation here. Um, spins, uh, so, so there, there's an analogy uh, of spins that get a very bad rep because it's due to, to get a very bad rep. And that's because uh, people think about spins as something actually spinning in space. So let me tell you where this analogy with things spinning come from. Uh, and uh, in the end, I'm going to, to, to really say this is a bad analogy, but so that you know, there's actually nothing that is spinning. So, and let's go back to classical physics, maybe the physics that you learned in high school. So uh, for example, if you have a loop of a wire that is carrying a current, as you see here to the right, I let I be the electric current, the area of this loop of current be A. Uh, you might remember that um, there's a magnetic field generated by this loop of current. Um, there is, uh, in such a circumstance, there is uh, a quantity called magnetic dipole moment that is generated and the magnetic dipole moment is, is uh, denoted mu. And mu has a magnitude that is equal to the electric current times the area of this current loop. Uh, mu moreover is perpendicular to uh, the, the plane of this defined by this area. Okay, And the direction of this mu is given by the right hand rule when the thumb is pointing towards the, the direction of the current. And it turns out that this quantity called, again, magnetic dipole moment interacts with magnetic fields. And in particular, you can think about this magnetic dipole moment as a really tiny magnet, as you can see uh, here in this picture. And one of the ways that, uh, that uh, such magnetic dipole moments uh, interact with magnetic fields is, for example, if you put a magnetic dipole inside a magnetic field or equivalently a tiny magnet into a uniform magnetic field, for example, as you see here in the middle, in the middle section, uh, what happens is that there is a torque into this magnet or tiny magnet or this magnetic dipole. That is, uh, there is a tendency of uh, this tiny magnet, say, to align uh, in, in a particular way with respect to, to magnetic field. There's going to be some movement. And in fact, the torque is going to be given by a cross product that maybe you, you learned in high school between the uh, magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field. And also, importantly, uh, there's going to be an energy of interaction between this magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field uh, given by, and we saw this quantity earlier, given by minus time the dot product between the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field. Again, um, dot product means how aligned those two vectors are. And there is a minus sign here to show that the minimal energy, the best energy is achieved when the magnetic moment is parallel to this magnetic field as shown in this middle plot here. Okay, So for a magnetic moment that can be up or down, uh, when the magnetic moment is opposite to this magnetic field, there is a higher energy of interaction. So this is what happens with a classical uh, loop of current. And it turns out that an electron moving in a circle really looks like a loop of current. Okay, so imagine that you have an electron going through some sort of orbit uh, with, a, with a loop radius r. Um, it, it, uh, given 
a angular speed, its tangential speed is related to this angular speed uh, and the loop radius. Those are high school uh, formulas. Maybe you, you want to, to, to have a look at those at some other point. Then given those things, you can define an electric current if the electron is sort of moving. And um, there's also another quantity that you might remember from uh, high school called angular momentum L, which is uh, a vector okay, that is given by the cross product between the radius that the electron is going around times the momentum of the electron, um, which is also given by the mass of the object, the electron, times the uh, tangential speed of the electron. Um, one can calculate the absolute value, the, the, the length of this vector. This vector lives in a plane that is perpendicular to the speed and the radius. Okay? And again, uh, we can use a right-hand rule to, to see the, the direction of this uh, angular momentum, which here in this picture is given by this, this arrow here with the L. Right? It turns out that if, as before, as in the previous slide, we define a magnetic dipole moment given by I, the current times the area, okay? If we do exactly as before, the current times the area that the electron is going through, we get that the magnetic moment uh, look like, looks like this. It's a multiple of the charge of the electron. It's divided by the mass of the electron, and it is uh, a function of the magnitude of this angular momentum L. Here, here's where the, the, the analogy sort of go, goes weird. Okay, so when people first started doing those approximations, they uh, realized that uh, the magnetic moment in such a case would be independent of R, independent of the radius of the electron. So they, they made this approximation. They said something like this. Well, if we let the radius become very, very tiny, which would be more or less approximated by an electron spinning in place. And since a rotating charge produces a magnetic moment, well, we have the perfect recipe for a bad analogy. So this is where the analogy with spinning comes from, because for example, in this bad analogy, a spinning, uh, a, a electron spinning in place in one direction uh, would be like a tiny magnet with one pole, like say the north facing up and the south facing down. And an electron spinning in the other direction would uh, basically represent uh, a tiny magnet, a magnetic dipole with the opposite polarity here, right? So this is where the idea of spin up and spin down uh, comes from, okay? Uh, this is a bad, bad analogy. There is nothing spinning. Uh, but since it's very ubiquitous, and now given that you know exactly that it's just a bad analogy, we are going to keep on using this analogy, uh, especially for uh, spins one half. So electrons, uh, in, in one configuration, have a magnetic moment up. Electrons in the other configuration have a magnetic a dipole moment down. Again, this is a bad analogy. Uh, you have to remember that the best way of looking at this is using uh, this this sort of arrow placement here that I'm not really talking too much about. So from from now onwards, we can take those things as uh, as, as as like two different spin states: spin up and spin down. Okay, but again, repeat after me: nothing is actually spinning at all. So Elementary particles, protons, electrons, atomic nuclei as a whole, photons, and other fundamental particles, they all have spin. They don't spin, they're not spinning. And again, they all have spin. Spin is a fundamental property of matter, even if this spin, this magnetic property is, uh, is zero, okay? Meaning that they don't interact with magnetic fields. So um, 
I have one slide about the quantum mathematical description of a particle with spin one half. So we're only going to focus now on particles with a magnitude of, of with spin of a magnitude one half. And I have one slide on like what the wave functions representing such particles with spin one half, what they look like. Okay. So uh, it turns out that um, the wave function representing uh, a spin one half uh, looks like this. It's uh, in, in general. It's a uh, column vector with two components. Uh, the spin up state, for example, is going to be represented by a vector, for example, one, zero. The spin down state is going to be represented by the vector zero, one. And note that any combination of those two vectors here can generate any column vector with two lines, A1 and a2. So the most generic spin state is given by this superposition, that's the language that we learned yesterday, superposition of spin up and spin down with coefficients a1 and a2. If you remember, uh, in order for this most generic wave function to be normalized, the absolute value of a1 plus the absolute squared plus the absolute value of a2 squared have to uh, be equal to one. And again, we say that psi is in a superposition of up and down. And uh, we motivated that if we want to measure uh, the spin, the, the result of the measurement will be classical. The spin will be found uh, in up or down equivalently with the energy of up and down. But the probability that the psi is found in, in up, for example, is given by this absolute value squared of this bracket, bra up ket psi, which we motivated was to be read as the probability that psi is found in, this, in the state up, and that's given by absolute value of a1 squared. Similarly, the probability that the psi is found in spin down is absolute value of a2 squared. So because the sum of those equal to one, it's exactly what we would expect from probabilities, right? If there's a 30% probability that you are in spin up, there's a 70% probability that you are in spin down. So uh, to the right, I just put here uh, a picture um, that says that um, so sometimes people encode quantum bits or qubits in spin states. Uh, I, I really like uh, this picture because here it shows that you can have, in the scrappy analogy, a uh, magnetic dipole pointing down, maybe an electron uh, spin spinning, not spinning, in one direction with a magnetic dipole down. The other state here uh, has a magnetic dipole up, and if the elect if the if this uh, spin is in a superposition of up and down. I like this picture here because it shows that it's both, its magnetic moment is both up and down. So sometimes people depict this as, as being like a, a slanted arrow. I don't like that. This is, I think, a better picture. It's both up and down at the same time. So spins, because they have like two dimensions, like they, they have two, their wave function looks like uh, a column vector with two lines. It's um, usually, uh, you know, it's it's the it's the ready generalization of a classical bit. So a spin sort of looks like a quantum bit, and a quantum bit can be put in a superposition the same way that a spin can be put into a superposition. That's the one slide that I had for that. Let's talk a little bit about magnetic resonance. Okay, and. Um, Okay, and magnetic resonance uh, has to do with the fact that spins can be controlled by magnetic fields. Okay, so uh, in the absence of a magnetic field, so again, in this in this analogy of spins pointing in different directions, in the absence of a magnetic field, spins don't really have a preference to where they point. They they look like the spins that you see there in this picture. However, in the presence of a static magnetic field, this static magnetic field has one consequence, which is to give a preferential axis of alignment. So it turns out that the spins align 
around this axis. Note here that no, not all spins are aligned in the same directions, right? There are spins pointing up and spins pointing down. Again, in this crappy analogy, and again, for a spin one half, which is what we're discussing from now onwards, because without loss of generality, but this static magnetic field sort of gives a preferential axis to those spins. Uh, the second thing that a static magnetic field does is to split the energy for this uh, magnetic dipole moments that are aligned with the field and that are misaligned or anti-aligned with the field. So you can see uh, this here in this uh, diagram, right? So you have in the presence, uh, it's, so basically uh, with increasing magnetic fields, there is a split in the energies of the spins with one alignment, okay? In particular, the spins that are aligned with the magnetic field have a lower energy okay, than the spins that are anti-aligned with the magnetic field. This splitting in energy called delta E here in this picture increases as we increase the magnetic field um, uh, strength. Okay? And one thing that I would like you to notice is that even, so even though the spins that have um, a magnetic dipole anti-aligned with the field, there are spins that uh, are that, that keep on having this orientation, even if uh, this configuration has a higher energy. Okay, so there's a slight population imbalance. Okay, there's going to be slightly more uh, spins that like to align with the magnetic field because their energy is small. There is still plenty of spins, say, in a solution. If you if you have a lot of spins in a bag in the presence of a magnetic field, there are going to be spins that have this higher energy. Uh, we've mentioned before that the energy of interaction with a, with a magnetic uh, dipole moment and a magnetic field was given by this minus dot product between the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field, which meant, again, that uh, there's a splitting in the energy, right? Lower energy for spins aligned with the field, higher energies for spins anti-aligned with the field. And if you just consider a spin which can have up or down with respect to the field, uh, this difference in energy is given by twice the magnitude of this energy of interaction here, right? So it, it's it's like, uh, there is a difference in energy which is equal to twice this magnitude here. And it turns out, and that's a very important result. Okay, so up to, to now, we were talking about static magnetic fields, DC fields, continuous fields. It turns out that if you have this static field and now you apply an oscillating magnetic field, if you choose very carefully your oscillating magnetic field, very cool things can happen. Okay, so here's the idea. You are in this configuration here, you know, like spins with, with one spin uh, have one energy, spins with the other energy have another energy. If you pick, a, a magnetic field that has a frequency. So magnetic fields uh, are electromagnetic fields. They're, they're light, basically they're composed of photons, if you remember from yesterday. If you pick the frequency of those photons in the magnetic field that you apply on top of this static field, right? And if you say that you apply a magnetic field with frequency F given by the difference in energy divided by Planck's constant. If you remember, we saw this formula yesterday in a different way. We said that the energy is equal of a photon is equal to H times F. Here, I'm just saying, pick the frequency of a photon so that it corresponds to the difference in energy between spin up and down divided by the Planck's constant. If you apply this type of oscillating magnetic field as a function of time, it turns out 
that you have an extraordinary knob of control over the spins. By bringing a cable with, uh, with a field, basically, uh, that uh, with a magnet or, or making coils that, uh, that produce a field that oscillates with this particular frequency here can drive the spin back and forth between quantum states via non-trivial, like non-classical spin superpositions. So that basically you can start doing things like this. So have a look at this picture here. This picture, okay, in the y-axis, you've got some sort of signal, doesn't really matter, that tells us what the spin state is. Okay, it can be, uh, as, as we're going to see, it can be an electric voltage, it can be fluorescence intensity, okay? This is some signal in the y-axis. In the x-axis here is the duration of this applied uh, oscillating magnetic field. What you see here is uh, an oscillating uh, a curve, okay? And here, how to read this curve. This curve means that if you are uh, in the bottom of the signal, say you are at spin state up, if you are at the top of the signal, you are in spin state down, and if you are anything in the middle of this curve, your spin is in a superposition of alpha, of, of up and down, in a way that Say if you're very close to the top, your your superposition is way skewed towards the the down state. If you're very close to the bottom, your superposition is skewed towards the up state. So for those of you uh, who are experts, this is called a uh, Rabi oscillation plot. Uh, importantly, this frequency of oscillation has nothing to do with the photon frequency of your field, it just has to do with the strength of the field, that is how much power is in your cable, is in your coils, okay? Uh, so basically, uh, this is a very nice way of having control over the spins, okay? This is something that is at the root of magnetic resonance methods, is at the root of, say, quantum computing, because if you want to prepare different spin states well if you take this curve you know that if you if you apply a, 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 um, an oscillating field up to a certain duration for example up to here you are going to be in a certain superposition of up and down so this is a fantastic tool to control to prepare any spin states that you care about okay that's amazing that's a very important knob that you have so you can make you can control quantum states of matter by applying um, electromagnetic fields uh, for a certain duration okay and this is sort of uh, for reasons that i won't have time to explain this is the the the, the method of choice to um, in magnetic resonance methods to control the states of spins so I like it so much that I'm going to, to write it in red. It's a very powerful knob to tune th these, this extra degree of freedom called spins in matter. So it turns out that uh, the same type of oscillation, there's a second way that we can generate the same type of oscillation between uh, quantum states. When people are, are doing those things in the lab, sometimes it's more convenient to use those uh, oscillating AC fields with a certain frequency. Uh, and it, it's an active way of controlling. Uh, however, there's a similar phenomenon that happens in quantum biology. Well, it can also happen in the lab, except that in the lab, it's more convenient to do this with AC fields. But there's a similar phenomenon that, that, that happens uh, if you, in, in addition to this magnetic field that lifts the degeneracy, which is static, if you add another, a, sec, a second static field uh, in a direction that is perpendicular 
to this magnetic field that lifts the degeneracy. So it's another static field. Um, and uh, this addition of a second static field, uh, to some extent, has the same consequences as if we were adding this uh, oscillating field. The second static magnetic field can also induce transitions between quantum states. And we're going to see that um, this sort of phenomenon uh, is of interest in the field of uh, spin-based quantum biology for the spin-based modalities, the spin flavor of quantum, model uh, of quantum biology as we're going uh, to see uh, from here onwards. Okay, so that's the important part of this discussion for quantum biology. So we don't need uh, any fields with frequency. A second static field can do can do sort of the same. It's it's another knob to control those spin states putatively or potentially even in nature, definitely even in chemistry. So um, for nuclear magnetic resonance, I am not going to talk a lot about that. OK. Uh, if you're curious about nuclear magnetic resonance, which you can do, with which you can do imaging, with which you can uh, learn about the properties of materials that contain spins, I recommend this this video here uh, prepared from uh, by, by Johns Hopkins University. It's a very nice animation on what happens uh, for nuclear magnetic resonance. I also recommend it. Th th there's a lot of magnetic resonance books. This is by far the best that I know. But I would like to point out some things about magnetic resonance, okay? uh, which is different from what I'm going to uh, talk about in, 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 in the rest of my talk, which is going to be very important, especially given the next two talks. Nuclear magnetic resonance controls nuclear spins, not electron spins. I won't have time to talk, but nuclear spins have a much harder time talking to magnetic fields than electron spins. Electron spins see uh, magnetic fields way easier than nuclear spins do. Okay. Uh, because we're talking about nuclear spins that don't talk a lot with magnetic fields, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, requires huge static magnetic fields on the order of three to five Tesla. So for comparison, the magnetic field of the Earth is about 50 micro Tesla. The magnetic field of your cell phone, when you put your cell phone like this, is about one milli Tesla. So uh, inside a magnetic resonance imager, you have three to five Tesla. That's huge, huge, huge. And for nuclear magnetic resonance, the higher the field, the better it is. Okay. And I just want to say that this works very differently from the type of, and we're going to see what this means, electron spin dependent chemical reactions that us are usually studied in the spin flavor of quantum biology. Okay, So let's talk about the spin flavor of quantum biology. Uh, and I'm going to, to put three different things uh, in this in this section. I'm going to talk about optically detected magnetic resonance, which is another way of reading out uh, spin states. Oh, I didn't mention, but um, in nuclear magnetic resonance, the way that you read out spin states is via uh, electric el electric signals. Okay, uh, And there's another way of reading out spin states, which has to do with fluorescence, which is usually referred to as optically detected magnetic resonance. In route, to optically detect the magnetic resonance, we're going to talk about quantum sensing and hopefully a little bit about spin-dependent chemical reactions. Okay, so um, I like to start this part of the talk by saying that I think that humankind is obsessed with measuring things better because it means that we understand nature better. Bear, bear with me, we're, we're going to get somewhere. So we can think about measuring better frequencies. This is an atomic clock that sits at NIST, the National Institute of Technologies and Standards in the US, and it defines very precisely what a hertz or what a second is based on atomic transitions. We can think about measuring better magnetic fields so that the image of a baby is better resolved. And yes, this is the magnetic resonance image of a baby inside the mother's belly. Or we can think about measuring better accelerations with those tiny little accelerometers so that your gaming experience is enhanced. But the question that I ask is what happens if the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? 
or worse, what happens if the object causing the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? I'm going to argue that in this case, you need a tiny little sensor that can measure tiny little quantities. If the sensor is tiny, let's make it very tiny. Let's make it quantum. For reasons that I won't have time to explain, but uh, reasons that underlie, that can be mathematically proven and that underlie a field called quantum sensing, one can actually prove that if one uses a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. I'm going to talk about uh, a technological quantum sensor, okay, uh, in the form of an electron spin inside the material diamond that can be put to use as a very sensitive Magne quantum enhanced magnetic field sensor. And I'm going to do this because I'm going to argue really soon that the same type of quantum sensing seems to be active inside, uh, in nature. Okay, So that's the promise. A electron spin in diamond can be put to use as a magnetic field sensor. The particular uh, electron spin in diamond uh, that can do this uh, actually exists within a uh, lattice defect in the material diamond, uh, that is, uh, and this lattice effect is part of a uh, class of crystalline defects that is called a color center. Color centers are, are crystalline defects responsible for the color of those nice diamonds that you see there, and they're called uh, color centers because they have the very remarkable property that when you shine light at those crystalline defects, they absorb the light, get excited, and then de-excite by emitting light back. This light is called fluorescence. The particular electron spin that, uh, that, that, I, uh, that, that is going to be put as a quantum sensor, um, it uh, consists of a trapped electron in this, in this uh, crystalline defect. Okay? It actually arises. Uh, in a particular type of crystalline effect, just so that you know, it's a very famous uh, 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 quantum sensor in diamond. Uh, it arises naturally, but it can also be engineered. And uh, it happens when a vacancy, a missing carbon atom in the diamond lattice sits nearby to a nitrogen, which is the most commonly occurring substitutional impurity in the carbon lattice. This defect, unsurprisingly, is called the NV, the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. And it turns out that uh, this defect behaves as a single electron spin, okay, uh, differently from electrons that usually occur free in nature. The spin of this trapped electron is one. The magnitude is one. So if you remember, the, there are three possible spin states because two times the magnitude of, of the spin, two times one plus one gives us three, three possible states. We're going to see those three possible spin states very, very soon. The way that we can track those in the lab is the following. We can put a diamond um, slab on top of a moving stage, and then we move this slab of diamond around uh, at the same time that we shine light onto this material, this diamond. And the idea is, as we're moving around, once the laser hits one of those defects, it's a color center so that it absorbs light and then fluoresces light back that we can then detect. This is what it looks like at increasing zooms. And it's quite remarkable because here at this bottom right picture here, you're seeing the fluorescence signature of a single electron spin. The For the, the experts, the uh, defect itself is way tinier than this, is atomic in size, but this uh, blob here, this light emitted is diffraction limited. Okay, So it's really cool because I didn't talk to you about that, but for nuclear magnetic resonance, you need gazillions of spins in order to have any appreciable signal. Here, you can have actually the fluorescence signature, the, 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 the presence, you can read the presence of one single electron spin. And that's quite remarkable. Uh, but what's remarkable about this, and uh, I, I mentioned this for a particular reason that's going to come, is that this blob has the very interesting property that it has a quantum state dependent fluorescence intensity. This means that just by uh, looking at how strongly this blob is emitting light, how strongly your counts are in your computer, you can actually infer if uh, in which spin quantum state your uh, spin 
is. Okay, so it's a very convenient way of what's in jargon uh, known as quantum state readout. You determine the quantum state by looking at fluorescence intensity. I'm going to spend some time talking about how uh, that happens, okay? Because the state dependence fluorescence intensity, quantum state dependence, spin state dependence fluorescence intensity is linked to the energy levels of this uh, effective electron spin that is trapped. Okay, and, and there's a reason why I'm going through this. So it turns out that I mentioned that that particular spin is a spin one. So it has three potential spin uh, levels okay, that I plot here. I call them minus one, plus one, and zero. You can think about the vertical scale here as energies. Okay? And it turns out that this particular uh, spin has an extra metastable state. It's, it's an extra state, spin state here between the ground states and between like the sort of the same picture here. There, there's like three states like this up there when they are excited, but at room temperature, for example, uh, we cannot really distinguish between those three. They're very, very close in energy. Well, it turns out that if you start with an electron spin state in zero, you shine light onto uh, that defect, uh, onto that spin. The spin absorbs light, as we mentioned before, and then basically it uh, fluoresces back. Oops, there's a FL missing. I have no idea why. It fluoresces back, it emits light back, and it goes back to state zero. Same thing, if you start at minus one, you shine light, it goes back by fluorescence, to state one and for state plus one, two. Except that this is not the full picture. This process here occurs with a probability that is smaller than 100%. If you start in state zero, 90% of the time, this is what it happens. You shine light, it fluoresces back. But if you are in state minus one or plus one, you shine light with, with this process of fluorescing happens only with 70%. Uh, of probability. So where is the missing probability, right? What what are the other thirty percent of the of the cases? What's really happening? And it turns out that in the thirty percent uh, of the cases, if you start in states minus one and plus one, and five percent of the cases, if you start in state zero, if you do the same thing, if you shine light onto the state, instead of it decaying back via fluorescence, uh, it decays back to the ground state, not via uh, light emission, but by, by something that's called phonon assisted. It's like a, a different way of losing energy that does not involve light. There's no light emission. And it turns out that this process, uh, again, does not emit light. And actually, even if you start at minus one or plus one, brings you back to state zero okay so the first the same thing occurs for those uh, other states so the first thing that you see and forget about this thing in red this thing in red shouldn't have been there but uh, the first conclusion is that after some time if you're doing this this cycle many many times right if you're shining light constantly uh, onto this spin at some point right you're emitting light back and forth. At some point, though, this uh, non-radiative, this pathway that does not emit light is going to kick in. So basically, regardless of where you started, if you keep shining light at some point, you end up in this state zero. Okay, But before that time, because the two pathways, the if you are in state plus one and minus one, and if you're in state zero, because you emit light on average a different amount of time, right? For state minus one, you only emit light 70% of the time, and state zero, you, end, you, you emit light 90%, 95% of the time. Before that long time where everything is back to zero, you can actually distinguish the quantum state of this spin by fluorescence intensity. So if you uh, plot the fluorescence counts as a function of the time during which you apply light to this defect, and then you count 
those 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 light counts there is an effective window during which the electron spin states can be distinguished given a fluorescence intensity and i have no idea why why the fls have been missing that that seems very specific given a fluorescence intensity so Basically, just by tracking fluorescence intensity, you can actually uh, read out the spin state, okay? which is very cool. Uh, I, uh, but but I, I told you that it can be put to use as a very sensitive magnetometer, and here how this works, and that's the field of quantum sensing. So here I singled out two of those three uh, spin states from this spin, okay? And it turns out that their difference in energy is in the microwave. This uh, vertical dimension here, you can think of it as energy. It turns out that state zero is insensitive to magnetic fields, which means that in the presence of an external magnetic field, it stays there, nothing happens. Whereas state one is sensitive to magnetic fields, meaning that in the presence of a magnetic field, state one will be promoted by a tiny quantity called delta. Okay? And it turns out that it's well known that this delta quantity via something called Zeeman interaction, this shift in energy is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field. And now this is like your crash course on quantum sensing. This is, uh, this is a very generic statement that I, I don't think is made enough. The problem of measuring a magnetic field using a quantum sensor is actually mapped into the problem of being able to measure a detuning, a shift delta from a known resonance, from a known energy difference in the absence of a magnetic fields. Okay? And engineers and physicists and chemists have known how to measure shifts from known energy difference for uh, many, many decades. And this is a general feature of quantum sensing. Usually there is a, a certain energy difference between two allowed quantum energy states, and you know this energy difference, this energy difference changes in prescribed ways uh, due to the quantity that you want to measure. There can be a magnetic field, an electric field, temperature. And because the experimentalist knows how to measure the shift, uh, you can measure the shift, and then you can uh, get to know this uh, this very precise quantity. So that's how this works. For reasons that I won't have time to explain, this only works while the spin is well described by the properties of quantum mechanics, uh, which in this case means that the spin can remain in a superposition in this case of zero and one. Everything that starts classical uh, that starts quantum dies classical for reasons that will maybe become clearer later on in the week. Um, a spin that is put in a superposition will, with time, lose its ability to be in the superposition. Okay, And for this particular spin in diamond, uh, the time that it takes more or less for you to lose your quantumness, also known as your decoherence time, is about two microseconds at room temperature and uh, in the bulk of the diamond lattice. So, so basically, the idea is that everything uh, goes back to, if you will, a signal processing problem. What one wants to do is sort of try to control this spin so that it can remain for longer and longer as a bona fide, as a proper quantum superposition. Okay, And the idea is like, uh, you have a swing, right? You know that if you kick the swing at particular times, you can keep it oscillating for longer and longer. And it turns out that the way that you can control those spins so that they can be longer and longer uh, as, a, as, a, as a quantum object, you can do this by applying electromagnetic fields, by applying uh, magnetic fields, if you will, in a way that we just seen uh, in the slides about magnetic resonance. And the idea being it's a signal processing problem because if you have a signal yielded by your quantum sensor as a function of time, right, the moment, so you have a signal and then you can Fourier transform it to get information about the property that you want to measure, say frequency or magnetic field. It turns out that as the, the signal flattens out, there is, um, if, if you, if you, th there is no 
meaning it continues to acquire the signal. If you can keep the signal going on for longer and longer and longer, then uh, as you Fourier transform it, you can have a better resolution in your spectrum. But just that, that's just for the experts in the field. The big picture here is having a tiny little sensor that can sense tiny little quantities very close to tiny uh, little samples. Okay. Not going to talk about that. So um, it turns out that I have just shown you a quantum sensor that works at room temperature and in noisy environments. Very at room temperature, no need for vacuum, very close to a sample, right? That could be, even be a biological sample. I'm going to argue that there are spins, and, and both Margaret and Daniel are going to argue that there are spins within proteins that seem to be working as very fine quantum enhanced magnetic field sensors as well. And in order to talk about that, we need to, to, to see how the shift went from, uh, from spins to chemistry to biology. And so let's talk about biology at the nanoscale, which is basically the chemistry. It's been known for decades uh, that in test tube chemistry, uh, magnetic fields can alter the final products of a class of chemical reactions that are spin dependent. Okay, so to zero order, here's how it's known to work in test tube chemistry. There's a chemical reaction happening, and at some point, this chemical reaction comes to a crossroads. At that point, the chemical reaction effectively looks for the electron spin state uh, of a particular electron. If this spin is up, the chemical reaction continues to one branch. If this spin is down, the chemical reaction continues through another branch. Importantly, the macroscopic final products of those two branches are different. So it's known from basic chemistry, from test tube chemistry, that uh, a finicky quantum property can have big time macroscopic consequences on the fate of a chemical reaction. It turns out that if at the moment where this chemical reaction is at this crossroads, the a particular electron spin sees an, a magnetic field nearby, I won't have time to explain, but this electron spin is going to, to, to talk to this external magnetic field in a way that is indistinguishable from what I just explained to you in terms of quantum sensing. It's going to quantum sense this magnetic field, superposition is going to be involved, and uh, one of the consequences of this interaction is the fact that the magnetic field will actually change the probability that the electron spin is found up so that the chemical reaction continues through this branch, or the electron spin is found down and the chemical reaction continues through this branch. Uh, so uh, to cut a long story short, magnetic fields can alter also via the property of spin this um, probability, like the macroscopic outcomes of chemical reactions. Now, the chemical reactions, this is true, like that chemical reactions can depend on a single spin. The chemical reactions that you're going to, to hear Margaret and Daniel talk about, they depend on the spin states of two electrons, okay? Two, spins, two electron spins can be either uh, pointing in the same direction or pointing in different directions. And it's basically the generalization of what I've been telling about one spin quantum sensing to two spins. So a magnetic field can alter the probability that the spins are both pointing in the same direction, giving one chemical pathway, or the magnetic field can influence the probability that the two spins point one up, the other one down, thus making the chemical reaction go to another pathway. So this has been demonstrated in test tube chemistry at room temperature in solution, the gas phase, solid state, and for magnetic fields as small as the Earth's, which is smaller than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to your face. Um, it turns out that the whole shebang goes from chemistry to biology because people wanted to know how birds migrate. Okay, I really don't care about birds. Uh, we're going to see that this is way more generic than just that, but birds have the big advantage that they brought the conversation from chemistry to biology. It's known that birds, when they migrate, they use, at least as a partial cue, the tiny magnetic field of the Earth. And people were trying to model how they do this. In the end of the 70s, a crazy theoretical biophysicist called, uh, called Klaus Schulten proposed the following. 
Well, were the same type of spin-dependent chemical reactions active under physiological conditions in the birds, somehow birds and other organisms in general could sense magnetic fields to the extent that they could sense the different physiological concentrations of products coming from these spin-dependent chemical reactions. So maybe, okay, this has not, neither been proven or disproven for birds. Maybe a bird uh, facing right or left would see different magnetic field lines, and maybe those different magnetic fields would modulate a physiological parameter. For example, maybe it would modulate the sensitivity to light in the retina in the eyes of the bird, so that the bird would see maybe brighter in the direction where it should go or darker in the direction that it should avoid. Okay, So it was a crazy, crazy hypothesis. But at that point, Bio, uh, experimental biophysicists got super excited about this hypothesis so that they started looking for animals, uh, animal because birds, animal proteins that could sustain this type of spin dependent chemical reaction. And at that point, the only animal, because birds, animal protein that was able, that was known to be able to, to sustain this type of spin dependent chemical reaction was a class of uh, proteins called cryptochrome. Okay. Uh, cryptochrome is a fluorescent protein in that it uh, absorbs light, gets excited, and then fluoresce back. Okay. Um, it uh, is present in the eyes of the birds, in the antennas of migrating butterflies. Butterflies also migrate in a way that it seems that they follow the magnetic field of the Earth. But cryptochrome is also present in all our cells because it also has circadian rhythm regulation functions. And it turns out that there's plenty of uh, cryptochrome is expressed throughout the tree of life. All those organisms there express cryptochrome. Um, and it turns out that there is plenty of studies that show that cryptochrome might be involved in sensing magnetic fields for those organisms boxed in red now. And it turns out that over the course of more than 40 years, evidence for this type of cryptochrome-based magnetosensing is really, really prevalent, ex oops, except at two very disconnected land scales. Okay, so to the left, I plot here uh, the tiny land scales, the land scales for uh, cryptochrome in solution. Okay, and uh, researchers uh, show without a doubt that cryptochrome in solution really behaves like a bona fide nature-made quantum sensor in a way that is very similar to uh, the, 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 the spin sensor in diamond, for example. For example, Daniel was the person to take this, this picture here, this top left picture. Here's what researchers did. Researchers took cryptochrome in solution, and then they shone a laser onto it. And then they tracked the light emitted by this vial of cryptochrome as a function of the time during which you applied this laser. Well, the first thing that they saw was that this fluorescence was decaying. It's called you're bleaching this fluorescence. You're, you're, you're messing up your laser, is destroying the protein. That's fine. But as the researchers post a tiny magnetic field on and off as they were tracking this fluorescence, and uh, basically uh, what they saw was that the fluorescence, as it decays, it's sort of being modulated up and down in a way that followed the magnetic field being turned on and off, as you can see here in this inset. Well, this is actually in a very good analogy with the spin in the material diamond. Because if you remember, just by looking at how strongly the diamond was emitting light, you could actually infer if the spin state of the, uh, uh, of the electron. Here, it's sort of the same thing. It, with different fluorescences, you can sort of uh, infer if the two spins were pointing one up, the other one down, and the chemical reaction continued through one pathway, or if both spins were up and the, the chemical reaction continued through the other pathway. Importantly, the reason why this works in cryptochrome is very similar to the reason why it works for the electron in diamond. There are competing decay pathways that give rise to this effect to this effective window during which you can actually uh, you can actually uh, distinguish the quantum states given by fluorescence by fluorescence intensity
Uh, moreover, there is more or less uh, good evidence, goodish enough evidence that shows that a cryptochrome might be a quantum for about one microsecond, uh, which is about the, the figure that I quoted for the spinning diamond. I quoted that uh, it, the, the spinning diamond was a quantum for about two microseconds, and here I'm quoting one microsecond. So this really looks like a quantum, a, a quantum sensor happening inside proteins. However, the next step of evidence goes from proteins in solution to big organisms, right? Birds and flies that respond to magnetic fields in a way that, it's, that is consistent with this type of spin-dependent chemical reaction happening under the hood. For example, during migration season, people catch birds and they want to see which way the bird wants to go out of the cage. And then they mess up with the magnetic fields. The birds want to go out through another direction. There are similar experiments uh, with flies and, and so forth. So everything is sort of, well, a lot of this evidence is consistent with the nanoscopic version for proteins in solution. But it's very hard at this point to say that, well, the organism is responding to that because there is a, a quantum thing happening inside it. So uh, th there has to be a little bit better evidence to unambiguously prove or refute that those behaviors uh, of organisms are indeed uh, due to a quantum interaction. And you're going to hear, for example, Margaret talk about the same type of effects in plants, for example. But this is not a talk about birds. The important part, as I hope it will become clear from Margaret and Daniel's talk, is the fact that the same type of spin-dependent chemical reactions seem to be underlying a whole lot of super, in the, super important biological phenomena. It's now known that it's not only cryptochrome that can sustain such spin-dependent chemical reactions, Okay, there's plenty of proteins that, that can sustain spin-dependent chemical reactions. And the same, there's macroscopic evidence that is consistent with the fact that plenty of phenomena seem to be active due to spin-dependent chemical reactions under the hood. For example, the regulation of uh, cellular respiration, the regulation of the production of um, um, reactive oxygen species, the regulation of stem cell growth, the regulation of DNA repair, the cool thing is that you don't even need to apply a magnetic field to see the results. It turns out that if you, for example, grow frog embryos uh, in, in a chamber that is very shielded from, say, the magnetic field of the Earth, which is tiny, right? What happens is that uh, you can uh, have, you can induce a lot of like weird mutation. So you don't even need to apply a magnetic field. You, it suffices for you to take out a magnetic field and you create weird physiological phenomena. So if you grow cells inside uh, very, very weak magnetic fields, uh, you change things like methylation rates that uh, Wendy Bean mentioned yesterday. And I think that this uh, is very interesting. Right, because you know this opens up a whole Pandora box of uh, questions. Right, for example, from interplanetary colonization. Right, if you want to reproduce in Mars, if you want to grow lettuce in Mars, what's the magnetic field on Mars? I mean, can you do this? Right, can you grow lettuce on Mars? How is the magnetic field of Mars mess up with our reproduction? To to, to things of of like of relevance on Earth, like can you learn how to tune those endogenous spin quantum degrees of freedom in biological matter towards a particular physiological outcome, right? Can you learn which magnetic fields tweak each chemical reaction? Each chemical reaction is tweaked by very particular magnetic field strengths and frequencies. Can you learn how to tweak those things uh, using those available knobs, no genetic engineering needed in order to say, uh, change things such as, uh, you know, health states uh, and so forth, right? So uh, this is the big message of my talk today. So today uh, we went over the definition of spins, a little bit of a mathematical description of a particle with spin one half. Um, we saw that magnetic fields can control spins in very interesting ways, right? Uh, we talked about 
uh, something that's called optically detected magnetic resonance, which I, I, I say that again means that just by looking at fluorescence intensity, you can infer spin state. I talked a little bit about quantum sensing with electronic spins, and I talked about the, the thing which is going to underlie this whole field of uh, spin quantum biology, which is the fact that there are spin dependent chemical reactions. So this is all I had to say. Um, and I think we're ready for Margaret. Hopefully, hopefully Margaret is there. Is Margaret there? Margaret is here. Awesome. Okay, so I'll shut up. She might just be refreshing her coffee or no. tea. Hello. You can go and ask, I mean, ask questions. I know that Clarice loves questions. So we don't have time. We don't have time. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you can have, I mean, come on, you can have a few questions. You're the organizer. Go ahead. Okay, two questions. Trainee questions. Yes. Who has questions? They're all okay. I'll get a question from the chat. Magnetosomes in some bacteria. Okay, so there are bacteria, uh, bacteria that actually have a string of big magnetite chunks. It's like big uh, chunks of magnetic material. Okay, and basically, the way that those bacteria those bacteria, they interact with magnetic fields is very different from what I just described. In those bacteria, those, those magnetite chunks, they sort of align with the magnetic field. Okay, And, and it's thought that when they do so, they, they push things around, they push open, closed ion channels. What I just described is very, very different. What I just described is absolutely iron free, no iron around, and it's only based on uh, spin states. No magnetic material needed, no iron needed at all. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Uh, did you um, see the question about time scales? Uh, can you can you can you read that for me? Uh, roughly, what are the time scales of all these spins? Do they keep okay. the same direction for picoseconds, nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds, so, or even seconds? This is one of the reasons why I think spins might be a, a nice way that uh, quantum is explored by nature. Uh, spin uh, dynamics, spin evolution land scales go between nanoseconds and microseconds, even at room temperature, even uh, under the messy conditions of the protein and so forth. That, that's, so this is unusually long. We're going to hear in the next days about, uh, for example, uh, things called excitons. Don't worry about that. But for, for example, exciton uh, processes, they occur with a much, much faster time scale, orders of magnitude faster. So I think that it would have been like a little bit of a low hanging fruit for nature to use uh, spin quantum properties exactly because spins uh, live like uh, quantum objects for a little bit longer than other processes. So land scales, uh, time scales of those time scales for those processes between nanoseconds and microseconds, which is long. And again, it doesn't really matter because the, the spin phenomena itself is very quick, but the result of those spin phenomena are felt downstream at much, much longer down, uh, time scales, right? The, the, the spin interaction itself is super fast, but the effects are felt downstream for much, much longer time scales. That's the important part too. And I think we, we, should, we should stop before, before we, we run out of time. Thank you, Margaret. I'm trying, I'm trying to do screen sharing here with great difficulty. So um, I suppose I should be able to share my screen, right? Uh, and I if it doesn't. You are co-host. Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, can I share? <laughs> 
It refuses to allow me. This is really oh, is bad. It giving you a message. It's saying uh, go to privacy settings, which is really useless because I don't have any settings. Hmm. hmm. I should have done Margaret, this before. A co-host. Yes. I believe. I yeah, I said yeah, her as I a co-host so. right away. It it says allow Zoom to open system security privacy to grant access and i did um, open it and i don't see any place to grant access so um sorry about this carry on clarice you're doing great you're doing great <laughs> screen recording um i mean Sorry about this. Unlock. So there's a question in the chat. Why are we? we so yeah. Why don't from, you answer okay, the question? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll keep on this saying. This is awful. Um, so, sorry. Um, so there's a question that I'm going to interpret as like where and, and Margaret is going to be way more. Well, I'm suited gonna, to answer I'm going this to question. get onto this screen if it's the last thing I do. Um, but, but there's a, a question of where can we look for proteins, for example, that can sustain such spin dependent chemical reactions? That's not a simple question. Uh, people know that uh, this type of spin dependent chemical reactions uh, are usually related to proteins involved in redox reactions. Remember from Wendy's lecture yesterday, which are chemical reactions related to losing or gaining an electron. Um, what else? Uh, Douglas Bresch is here. He's an expert in uh, another very cool molecule that can sustain uh, uh, spin phenomena. Uh, Douglas Bresch uh, studies um, um, melanin, which is the thing that gives the color, like the pigment, the pigmentation to our skin. And there is very cool yeah. spin physics in melanin as well. It, it will not let me share my screen. This is awful. I'm not sure what to do about this. Do, do you, how do you have your slides? Could someone else forward your slides on a separate screen? If you say, if I had your slides, um, and I they're on a PowerPoint. They're on a PowerPoint presentation. I can open just about every other document on my desktop except for that one. It, no, it, I mean that's fine yeah. if you want someone else to forward, you yeah. know, share and present your slides. I you I'm happy to do that, them. but it's a big file, and can you um, receive it? You do, know, do you have do you have PowerPoint, Nathan? Because yeah, I, I, don't yeah, have, I have PowerPoint. That's no okay. problem. I just have to yeah. get the file. Margaret, can you send it to to Nathan? Maybe. Yeah, that's it's a huge file. Uh, Nathan, can you put your your can you send your your email to um, Margaret, please? Yes, of course. Yeah, your email. Yeah, but it won't. I mean, I can't upload it on that. It's a huge file. Uh, right. Can you upload have... it to to like Drive or and then and then share uh, share, share the link with with Nathan? Other. Um, I can upload it to OneDrive, but not, I mean, I can send it by Hotmail, and then it'll be on OneDrive. Carry on talking, uh, Clarice. I'm almost suggesting that we go to Daniel, and then we come back to you. W would you be okay. available, Margaret? Yeah, yeah, I'll be available. Please do, because you're wasting time here. Go right. ahead. Yeah, and then sorry. and then we'll find Nathan and Margaret. Can you can you work to, to make yeah, this Yeah, I'll figure happen? it out. Okay. Okay, Daniel, are you this. ready? I'm not sure if Daniel is is in the room. Is... Um, oh, there he is. Okay. Well, hello, hello. I hope you can hear Hi, me. Hi, Daniel. Take what my a, place. What, this what, is what, depressing. What a surprise! Thank you, Margaret. You're very welcome. I am. Um... <laughs> well, let's let's see what I can do better. Yes, I'm sure you can do better. Okay, let me share my slides. Good. I hope you can hear me well. Perfectly. Perfect. Well, then uh, let me start my presentation. I have been asked to talk about the radical pair mechanism in, well, I guess the quantum biological context. 
just let me change this to presentation mode. And uh, well, off we go. So this is my agenda for today. You will see that it's relatively extensive. Uh, there are some repetitive thoughts. I will once again talk about spin and how spins manifest in radical pairs. Uh, talk once again about singlet and triplet states, just because I think it's very important to, to grasp these concepts. I will then also talk a little bit about cryptochromes, which is certainly something that Margaret is going to talk about a lot, just because this is also close to my own research. Uh, and I will go into more details, like the low field effect. Uh, is cryptochrome magnetosensitivity sensitivity truly quantum? Uh, talk a little bit about inter-radical interactions and about uh, radical pair recombination reactions where we can observe interesting quantum effects like, for example, the quantum Zeno effect. Good, but well, let me uh, address the first point, namely, uh, what is required to uh, or for a biochemical reaction to elicit weak magnetic field sensitivity? And in this context, in the context of this talk, there can only be one answer, and that is certainly, uh, well, a radical pair. So what is a radical pair? Well, this is a short-lived reaction intermediate usually, which comprises, as the name suggests, two radicals. And often these radicals are formed in tandem, whereby uh, two processes are particularly important. Namely, first of all, the electron transfer of a closed shell molecule, which is often photoinduced, and uh, which proceeds according to this scheme here, where a donor and an acceptor exchange an electron, thus ending up with a radical pair. So both these species have an unpaired electron, whilst preserving the overall spin state. So we're starting out from diamagnetic molecules, from singlet states, we end up with an overall singlet state. The second important process is bond fission, the homolytic cleavage of a bond as it is uh, shown here. So here this AB molecule shares a bond, which is split apart to produce again a radical pair uh, in an overall singlet state, if the initial state was a singlet state. And then eventually, uh, radicals can also diffuse around in solution, and they can randomly encounter. And if this happens, we form what is called an F pair. And these F pairs behave very much like triplet-born radical pairs. Uh, as I'm going to discuss later. Uh, this is just a simple illustration of um, such a photo-induced electron transfer process, this time happening between FAD, this is this molecule here, which absorbs light in blue and uh, lower, uh, uh, lower, lower um, wavelength spectral region, uh, and tryptophan. If FAD is photo-excited, an electron here is uh, excited from the HOMO, the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital to the LUMO, to end up with this state here, leaving uh, a hole here in the HOMO for uh, the excited uh, FID, which is then replenished from the tryptophan, well, to just form this radical pair. Now, both these species have uh, an odd number of electrons. They're both radicals. And the overall spin state uh, is still a signal. These uh, spins, these electrons, these odd electrons are distributed across the molecules and delocalized, as is shown here. So these are molecular orbit plots of these SOMOS, showing that the electron is kind of, well, flying around uh, the entire molecule. Uh, this radical pair is particularly important because it has been implicated with magnetosensitivity in the context of cryptochrome, uh, kind of the a mechanism that is sought to underpin magnetoreception, as it was already mentioned uh, uh, Clarice, and is later going to be discussed by uh, Margaret in much more detail. But for the moment, I just would like to point out that there is this project in cryptochrome that contains FID, which when photo excited undergoes this electron transfer process that I've just introduced to you, whereby a radical pair is being formed involving this FID, and a surface exposed tryptophan uh, molecule. Uh, and this radical pair is magnetosensitive. OK, but let us talk about, uh, well, what, what radical pairs, uh, or, or what radicals are, or what their properties are that makes them so special in the context of quantum biology. 
Well, the definition of a radical is that it has an unpaired uh, valence electron. And this means that they are certainly highly reactive in the first place, but in the second, that uh, they expose the property of spin. So usually spins of pairs of electrons are paired, they cancel each other. However, if you have an unpaired electron, then uh, the spin degree of uh, freedom is revealed, which causes ultimately this magnetosensitivity that we are interested in. So that leads me to the second question, namely, what is spin, which has already been addressed by Clarice to in quite some detail. I would like to just quickly go over this um, in order not to, to lose my, my, my concepts. But in any case, uh, so spin is an intrinsic form of angular momentum, which is car carried by elementary particles. And it's certainly uh, on its own a quantum notion, which means that it vanishes if we take uh, h bar uh, to zero. It does also not have a submicroscopic explanation, as Clarice has already pointed out. You cannot represent it as a rotation of a ball-like particle, for example. Uh, but it is uh, an intrinsic property. You should view it uh, in the same way as if you charge as something that is just attached to elementary particles. For fermions, like electrons, uh, the spin can take on two values or the spin projection can take on uh, two values, namely plus one half and minus one half, which led Wolfgang Pauli, who was the first to postulate spin, introduce it as a classically non describable two-valuedness. Uh, another important point is that spin is associated with uh, magnetic moments, that is, electrons are magnetic, and this is eventually what gives rise to all these effects that we're interested in. The first experiment that has shown uh, spin, or directly, I would say, was the schoen gerlach experiment, which is shown here, where uh, silver atoms are passed through an inhomogeneous magnetic field, whereupon they are split according to their magnetic moment. And the interesting thing about this is that the distribution that ensues from this experiment is bimodal, meaning that there are indeed, as Pauli has suggested, two possible uh, values of this spin projection, uh, and only two possible values, uh, which is the characteristic property of this uh, qu uh, quantity. Well, so what about these postulates by by, by Pauli? What, what, what they, are they in more detail? Well, Pauli has introduced spin as uh, a vector operator that obeys these commutator relations here, which is the kind of commutator relations that are also obeyed by angular, uh, orbital angular uh, momentum. And spin acts in a new space, is what Pauli said. And this space is completely characterized by two operators, namely the S squared operator, which measures the length of the spin vector, and the SZ operator, which measures the projection. And for a spin half particle, uh, there are only two possible values of this uh, projection, namely a projection of plus one half and minus one half, as Clarice has already introduced it to you in the previous lecture. The length of the spin vector here is given as the square root three over two h bar. The projection can assume these two values for the spin up state and uh, the spin down state as shown here. Uh, how do we Picture spin? Well, this is not how we picture spin. As Clarice has already pointed out, this is not the picture that you should have uh, associated with spin. This was, in fact, introduced by Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith in a, a very famous Nature publication in 1926, where they introduced spin as a really classically rotating, uh, or a, 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 the, the classical rotation of the electron in order to explain the anomalous Seaman effect. But that turned out to be wrong and impossible because the surface of the electrons would rotate at a superluminal speed if that was truly the case, as pointed out by Lawrence. Well, good. But let us now try to understand what happens if we put spin in a magnetic field. And this was already discussed by Clarice as well. Uh, that is, uh, we observe the Seaman splitting if we put a spin in the magnetic field. That is, the energy of the down spins is uh, reduced, and the energy of the up spins is increased because spins have associated a magnetic moment, and this magnetic moment can uh, align 
or anti-align with the applied magnetic field. What is more important in our context, however, is what happens to the spin, well, if we apply a magnetic field and, and watch it over time. That is, we are interested uh, in the question, well, what is the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for such a spin object? And the kind of motion that we observe there uh, is shown here. It's a precessional motion. That is, a spin precesses about an applied magnetic field such that its Z projection, which is this component here, is constant, whereas its X and Y component here oscillate around. This is the same kind of motion that we also observe for, say, a spinning top in a gravitational field, which is shown here uh, at the top. So these two kinds of motions are, in a sense, uh, analogous. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll skip that. So now this leads me to the uh, next question, and that is, how does spin manifest for radical pairs? Well, for radical pairs, we have two electrons, isn't it? So we have one electron on one uh, chemical species and, and uh, another electron on the other chemical species. We can combine these two electron spins, and we can combine them in two possible ways according to the laws of quantum mechanics. One is to anti-align these two spins such that one spin is exactly compensated by the other spin. And this is what we call a singlet state. This is a state that after this combination doesn't have a spin anymore and doesn't have an associated magnetic moment. Whereas we can also uh, add up these two spins uh, to form another state, which has a total spin of S equals one. And this is called a triplet state. There are three different ways to realize this kind of states. Uh, either we can combine it by uh, adding these two spins pointing upwards, or we can add the two spins in this form where they are both pointing downwards, or we can form a superposition where one is pointing upwards and one is pointing downwards, but such that the total spin uh, results. And the thing about radical pair reactions and the radical pair mechanism is that these radical pairs most of the time are uh, in a superposition state. They're in a superposition state that involves the singlets and the triplet states, and the expansion coefficients of this state are uh, a function of time. And interestingly, they're not only a function of time, but can be uh, interacted with by applied magnetic uh, fields. That is, this singlet triplet interconversion becomes a function of the magnetic field. Uh, it is most of the time driven by hyperfine interactions, but can be influenced and modulated by external magnetic fields. And if the singlet and triplet states have a different fate, well, then we will see this in the reaction products of uh, coupled chemical reactions. So therefore, the simplest possible reaction scheme of a radical pair is uh, shown here. It involves this radical pair in well, a spin correlated state. It needs to be either born in a singlet, or it needs to be born in a triplet state, or, uh, well, it needs to acquire some kind of spin correlation uh, over the course of its lifetime, for example, by chemical reactions. And the spin correlated radical pair uh, must be able to undergo some spin selective uh, reactions. That is to say, the singlet reaction products must be different from the triplet reaction products. And thirdly, we need a process that interconverts the singlets and the triplets. And this is provided by, well, magnetic interactions, by the interaction with the geomagnetic field, for example, or by hyperfine interactions, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. This is a more a concrete reaction scheme where I have tried to introduce a ground state. There, in this case, the ground state molecule is photo excited via some excited states forms these radical pair states initially in the singlet state. It undergoes this uh, coherent interconversion between singlet and triplet states. It can only recombine back to the ground state in the overall singlet state, because only this uh, is, uh, is, is spin allowed. Whereas it can, for example, form free ions from both the singlet and triplet state. Uh, thereby, we have chemical reactivity that distinguishes singlets and triplet uh, radical pairs 
and thus allows for magnetosensitive chemical reactions. Good. So how are these singlet and triplet states coherently interconverted? I think this is the main kind of point of the radical pair mechanism. And the answer is relatively uh, straightforward if we look at high magnetic fields, if we look at the scenario as it applies in the presence of a large applied magnetic field, which is uh, shown here. In these fields, the spins are quantized, as Clarice has already pointed out, along the magnetic field axis. Uh, and starting out from uh, the singlet, we might kind of represent it in the form as shown here. Now, what will happen if this do, or what will happen? No? Well, the spins will precess. No? The uh, elementary motion of spins is precession, as we have uh, discussed before. And therefore, the blue and the green spin will precess around the applied magnetic field. But what is if they're processing at different rates? Well, if they're processing at different rates, then one kind of moves faster than the other one. And we will end up, well, after some time, in a triplet configuration when starting out from a singlet. In between, the state here is a coherent superposition state, which uh, combines elements of or properties of the singlet as well as of the triplet state. But after some time, which is given as one over two times the difference in this Lama precession frequency, uh, we will end up with the T zero state. And this is exactly what is known as the delta G uh, mechanism, which is uh, shown here in, in a more kind of dynamic uh, visualization. Uh, we start out with the signal, we allow the spins to process the process at different rates, uh, and thereby we're interconverting singlets and triplets. If singlets and triplets have different reactivity, well, then oh, so the reaction products or the probability to form certain reaction products will oscillate over time. And this gives rise to a magnetic field and spin dependent uh, reaction yet. However, there are also other interactions than just the Siemens interaction that, that I've mentioned. Uh, there are also magnetic nuclei in radicals. And these magnetic uh, nuclei, this, uh, this is that is a uh, nuclei that have a uh, spin, interact with the electron spins. And if they do that, well, then we have additional sources of magnetic field that couple to the electron spin. The main contributors of nuclear spins that couple to the electron spins are protons and uh, nitrogens, in particular, uh, the nitrogen isotope uh, nitrogen of 14, which has a spin of one. Both these are more or less 100% uh, natural, uh, natural abundant, and are therefore uh, kind of, well, a central cornerstone of the radical pair mechanism. You can hardly form a radical pair which does not at least involve one hydrogen or one nitrogen. Here at the bottom, for example, I draw the hyperfine interactions of this FID and this tryptophan radical, which are thought to be relevant in the magnetoreception in the cryptochrome uh, process. And you see two different types of interactions here. You see some that look more like balls, uh, that is hyperfine interactions that are isotropic, that uh, do not depend on the direction of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the that we're looking at. Whereas others, like for example, this one here of the central nitrogen are strongly anisotropic, much stronger in this direction than they are uh, within the ring plane. This latter interaction is due to electronuclear dipolar interactions. This is just basically the interaction of two, well, magnetic moments, one magnetic moment of the electron and the other magnetic moment of uh, the, the nucleus, which just interact in the very same way as two bar magnets would interact. And the second type of interaction is the Fermi contact uh, interaction, which, uh, well, resides from the magnetic moment of the nucleus being different than that of a point dipole moment, and which can be expressed by this simple interaction, uh, Hamiltonian, which just involves a coupling constant, A, and the dot product of the spin of the, the electron, S, and the spin of the nucleus. Well, let us now try to understand what happens in radical pairs that uh, are involve hyperfine interactions and that are subject to an applied magnetic field. Well, such a radical pair can be described by this Hamiltonian, where we have the same Zeeman interaction that we've already seen before and uh, two hyperfine interactions. Uh, we can rewrite this in this form here, which should make apparent 
that in principle, this could be understood as the interaction of the spin with an applied effective magnetic field that comprises the applied field, the external magnetic field, and a hyperfine field due to the individual nuclear spins, which is just given as A1 times uh, the nuclear spin of the first particle and A2 times the nuclear spin of the second particle. All these different field contributions add up to uh, give rise to an effective magnetic field, which is shown here as the green vector. And if we allow the spin to, well, undergo dynamics due to this effective magnetic field, then this is the picture that uh, we see. The spin at every moment here is processing around, well, the effective magnetic field. And this effective magnetic field resides from the applied magnetic field and the magnetic field that is associated to the uh, nuclear spins, for example, N5 and N10 nuclear spins that are located here and here. And those all coupled together to give rise to this rather complex uh, motion. If we combine this motion with the motion of the spin in the second radical, like for example, here in a superoxide uh, molecule, which doesn't have any hyperfine interactions, then uh, this is the combined picture that describes the radical pair. So this one is relatively simple. And furthermore, the motion here is relatively slow because I have assumed that the applied magnetic field is equal to the G magnetic field, which is uh, a rather weak magnetic field. In the other case here, uh, the effect is still a G magnetic field, but the dynamics is way faster because the hyperfine interactions are stronger. In any case, if we just take out the two electron spins, and just look at their individual motion, one for the superoxide molecule, that's the slow one, uh, and another one for the flavin, then we see this kind of uh, picture from which we see that, well, there is an interconversion, there's an interconversion from singlets to triplets, singlets when they are anti-parallel and triplets when they add up in a parallel uh, fashion. In other words, uh, due to hyperfine interactions and the applied uh, magnetic field, we have interconversions from S and T plus states, from S and T minus states, and in addition, uh, S and T zero interconversion of the kind that I've uh, shown you already before. In fact, all these different interconversion processes interfere and give rise to this very complex dynamics that we have uh, seen. Uh, here, this is a slide that uh, summarizes this on a more quantitative level. That is to say, if you have been exposed to a little bit of quantum mechanics, then uh, you can understand what is going on by looking at uh, the Hamiltonian for uh, a single nucleus radical pair. That is a radical pair that comprises the Siemens interactions for the two electron spins and the hyperfine interaction of one of the spins with uh, a nuclear spin. And from this Hamiltonian, we can easily calculate that there are, are interactions, there are connections between the singlet and the T0 state, which gives rise to this dephasing behavior, to this different kind of uh, oscillation uh, uh, frequency, which interconverts S and T0 states. And then in addition, uh, there are uh, spin flips that are brought about by the non-secular hyperfine interactions, which can be written uh, as of here. The important point is that uh, these singlet triplet interconversions only work out well and efficiently if the states that are connected are close in energy. And in a radical pair, well, we have uh, lots of different ways to, to, to modulate the, the energy, uh, not least by applying uh, an external magnetic field. So this here summarizes the energy in an isotropic radical pair system. The pertinent interactions there are the exchange interaction, which splits the singlet and triplet states apart. Well, if you think about it, if you bring two radicals together, then very likely the radicals will form a bond. And if they form a bond, well, then the singlet state must be more stable than uh, the triplet state. And that is kind of the scenario that uh, corresponds to this energy splitting. And then in addition, we can apply magnetic fields. And if you apply the magnetic fields, then the states that have a magnetic moment will respond to the applied magnetic field. In particular, the T plus state will go up in energy. The T minus state will go down in energy. Uh, and the T zero state 
will stay at the same energy as uh, the singlet states because the projection of the spin on this preferred axis, as we've seen before, is plus one, minus one, and zero for these two states. Well, the exchange interaction does strongly depend on distance. That is, if we start out with a radical pair at uh, a small distance, then the singlet and triplet state will be split apart in energy by quite a substantial amount. However, if we take this radical stand apart, then eventually the energy of the singlet and triplet state will approach each other, and we will end up here in a region where they're quasi degenerate. If this happens, then the hyperfine interactions are, however, able to interconvert singlet and triplet states, uh, as I have indicated it here. So there uh, we kind of uh, start to engage into this uh, spin dependent dynamics, which eventually give rise to spin uh, dependent reaction products or magnetic field dependent reaction products. If we do the very same thing in the presence of an applied magnetic field, then uh, the scenario is as shown here. In an applied magnetic field, the only thing that is different is that the triplet states are here split by the Siemens interaction, as is shown here. Uh, so the T plus state is shifted up in energy, T minus state is shifted down in energy. As the two radicals separate, we will still end up here with a region where the singlet and the T zero state are quasi degenerate and can thus be interconverted. However, only the S and the T zero state can be interconverted here. Uh, the T plus and the T minus state have been split apart in energy, so they do no longer engage in this uh, spin dynamics that can give rise to spin dependent reaction products. I always would like to point out that there's one point here where the S and T minus state interconnect with a cross. And here, in fact, yes, we can obtain magnetic field effects from the S and the T minus mixing of the states due to the hyperfine interaction. So what does this mean for uh, the reaction yield? Well, the scenario is as shown here. In a zero magnetic field, in no applied magnetic field, uh, a, a radical pair is strongly connected. S and T plus state, S and T zero, S and T minus states are all connected and can interconvert. That is, if we start out, say, uh, with a signal precursor, if uh, we start out in this state and leave this radical uh, to engage in split dynamics for a while, then this population will distribute over all these states and will end up with a uh, probability of one quarter to find the system in the singlet state and one quarter to find it in each of the triplet states. If you do the very same thing in high magnetic field, then the situation is as shown here. In the higher magnetic fields, the T plus and T minus states are split apart from the T zero state. Thus, the hyperfine interaction can only connect the S and the T zero state. Therefore, starting out from uh, a singlet uh, precursor and allowing it to engage in, in, in spin dynamics will end up with a probability of one half in the singlet state and one half in the T zero state, whereas the T plus and T minus state will remain unpopulated, which means that we can, due to this underlying dynamics, uh, realize a magnetic field effect of 100%, meaning in high magnetic field, the system is uh, in the singlet state with a probability of one half, in low magnetic field only with a probability of one quarter, uh, meaning that there's a change of 100% in uh, the singlet product yield. So this is how these kind of dynamics look like in a, a applied magnetic field. If we don't apply uh, an external magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field, the applied magnetic field is zero, the dynamics look often something like that. Uh, that is, for example, for a radical pair where we start out in the singlet, due to hyperfine interaction, it oscillates here quickly between a singlet and a coherent superposition states involving all the singlet and all uh, the triplet states. If we apply a magnetic field, like for example, the geomagnetic field in addition, well, then we see that there is an additional undulation of this signal due to the Lama precession, due to the precession of the spins around the applied uh, geomagnetic field. This is a rather slow oscillation, 
because, well, uh, the geomagnetic field is weak. Uh, this is happening on a frequency of uh, only 1.4 megahertz. That is, it takes around uh, 710 nanoseconds for uh, an oscillation of, uh, of this kind to uh, complete. What, however, is interesting is uh, that the process is dependent on the orientation of the magnetic field. That is, if you point the magnetic field in one direction uh, and the other direction, we obtain a different singlet probability as a function of time. And the reason for that is that the hyperfine interactions are intrinsically uh, orientational. They're not usually isotropic, as we have seen before, in particular for the FAD radical pair. It's also important to point out that this process can be sensitive to weak magnetic fields, magnetic fields that are much, much weaker than uh, the frequencies uh, associated with the internal magnetic fields, namely the hyperfine interactions. It should also be clear that in order to find a sensitivity to the geomagnetic field, we'll thus have to wait a certain amount of time. That is to say, uh, the radical pair uh, dynamics, the kinetics, must be sufficiently slow in order for this to show up in reaction yields. So here, for example, I have assumed a certain rate constants associated with the singlet recombination and with the forward process of the order of, say, one microsecond. And in this scenario, well, you see that these different oscillations are picked up in the reaction products, giving rise to a reaction yield of 0 0.43 or 0 0.37 that indeed distinguishes these two different magnetic field orientations. If, however, I would uh, turn up the rate constants, if I would assume faster reactions, well, then eventually uh, no difference in these uh, reaction yields would ensure because I haven't allowed the system enough time to pick up the weak geomagnetic field. In other terms, uh, what is required is that these radical pair spin dynamics are sufficiently long-lived in order to show sensitivity to a particular magnetic field. That is to say the inverse reaction rate constant and also the spin relaxation time, as we're going to discuss later on, needs to be uh, larger than this characteristic time, which is associated with the LAM or precession in the magnetic field B. Okay. Um, I would like to point out that, that this kind of dynamics can, in fact, be observed. One can in indeed see these quantum beads, and this has been realized uh, already in the 80s by the group uh, of Morlin. Uh, by pulse radiolytic uh, studies, that is, uh, studies which are uh, initiated by the uh, absorption of uh, uh, an, an X ray pulse, uh, which forms radicals, which then we combine in a typically apolar solution. Uh, and in this recombination, singlet and triplet radical pairs form that can then undergo uh, spin dynamics. And this is shown here for, well, this particular molecule where there are 12 equivalent hyperfine coupled nuclear spins, which thus then gives rise to these nice quantum oscillations on the time scale here of uh, 100 nanosecond. Well, here's another example where this kind of dynamics is shown, but this time not arising from hyperfine interactions, but from a difference in the G factor from, from Lama precession uh, differences, uh, where we again see this, this uh, oscillations. Uh, where the oscillation frequency is increasing with the applied magnetic field, because this difference in Lama precession frequencies is proportional to the applied magnetic field. Now, since the 80s, this has not in fact been seen very often uh, until very uh, recently, where uh, here a group in, in Germany, uh, Professor Lambert and, and, and co workers, have shown a method of how to reveal these quantum beads also in complex uh, dyadic uh, system that undergoes some kind of photophysics. So here, uh, what they've introduced is the uh, pump push, uh, pump push spectroscopy, where uh, the system is photo excited, converts into a radical pair state, and would then eventually either recombine or form the triplet state. 
The problem is, however, that this triplet state is very long lived. Uh, and therefore, just recording the triplet concentration as a function of time will not reveal these uh, quantum oscillations uh, because, well, you will just accumulate the, the, the product states, uh, the states there, and will lose uh, all these uh, oscillatory properties. However, by applying these push pulls, uh, the system is further excited and can then, in an ultra fast fashion, recombine to the triplet state and thus recording uh, the triplet yield as a function of uh, the position of the pump, uh, that this push uh, pulse, one can indeed reveal again these quantum oscillations. Good. So how does this radical pair mechanism eventually uh, manifest? I, I have lost a little bit track about what, uh, what time I'm at, but uh, I'll just continue talking as long as you interrupt me, I guess. Good. Uh, so, well, let us see how all that plays out in, in cryptochrome. Well, I've already said that in cryptochrome, we have uh, a flowering cofactor, and this flowering cofactor can be photo excited. If it's photo excited, it undergoes an electron transfer process, which will form the flowering tryptophan radical pair here in the singlet state. This state can combine back in the, to the ground state, which is a spin selective process and can only uh, happen in the singlet state, whereas both these states can undergo proton transfer processes. For example, the flavin could be protonated, the tryptophan could be deprotonated, and it's thought that the secondary radical pair then induces some structural changes in the cryptochrome, which give rise uh, to signaling. And this mechanism has in fact been uh, studied. So there's a very recent uh, publication here by the, the Oxford and uh, Oldenburg groups where they have measured magnetic field effects on uh, the cryptochrome from the European robin and compared it to uh, that of uh, chicken and, uh, and doves. Uh, and as you see, there is a magnetic field sensitivity, uh, which is associated here with uh, the formation of long-lived uh, radical uh, pair states that involve a deprotonated tryptophan form and the protonated uh, FID radical. You will also notice that these effects uh, are here recorded at a much larger magnetic field than the geomagnetic field. That is magnetic field here of the order of well tens of millitesla, whereas the geomagnetic field is uh, of the order of uh, microtesla. That is to say there's still some kind of well uh, sensitivity uh, issue to overcome. But this is certainly a very clear cut demonstration of a radical dependent uh, spin dynamic process in a cryptochrome. The interesting thing about these uh, cryptochrome magnetic field effects is uh, shown here in a comparison of the uh, cryptochrome from Drosophila and uh, the plant Arovidopsis saliana that I think Margaret is going to talk about uh, a lot here. The interesting thing is that there is this uh, canonical uh, magnetic field sensitivity in Drosophila, whereas we observe what is called a low field effect for uh, the plant. That is an anti-phase feature here in the magnetic field sensitivity where the uh, magnetic field effect is not only negative like uh, in Drosophila, but uh, has a kind of positive contribution in this very weak magnetic field region. Later on, I will try to explain you where this is uh, coming about if time permits. I would also like to mention, and that is probably preparing for Margaret's talk, that uh, this uh, model that I've shown you now, the one that is based on the photo reduction, is not the only pathway that is being discussed in the context of cryptochrome. Also, the reoxidation, for example, is uh, actively pursued. And this is uh, motivated by uh, experiments like the one shown here that uh, use flickering light. That is to say, where light exposure and magnetic field exposure have been applied simultaneously or in a time shifted fashion, as shown here. As the birds were always oriented for both these scenarios, uh, the conclusion, as expressed here by uh, the Rich Course and also Margaret, uh, was that the true uh, magnetosensitive radical pair can only or needs to be associated with a dark state reaction, which could be the reoxidation reaction. 
these reoxidation pathways uh, shown here in this uh, diagram. So the idea here is that we somehow fought to reduce the flavin in the cryptochrome from the fully reduced form, which is then later reoxidized with uh, oxygen. Now, oxygen is a triplet molecule, and therefore the reaction of this uh, singlet and triplet state gives rise to a radical pair in the triplet state. This radical pair is supposed to comprise the flavin semigenome and uh, superoxide, which then again can undergo this spin uh, sensitive dynamics. Only the singlet here can recombine back to the, the ground state molecule, whereas both can in principle form a signaling state. So again, um, the signaling state might also emerge from a, a different species of this uh, redox cycle. What is thought then uh, to go on is shown in some more detail here, uh, where once again, we have this fully reduced form of the FID that is reacting with oxygen to form the radical pair in the triplet state. The radical pair involves here the superoxide and the flavin semigenome. Uh, by spin flipping, by this coherent interconversion, it can change into the singlet. The singlet can then uh, attach the superoxide here in this particular position, forming a hydroperoxide, which can eventually release hydrogen peroxide and the fully uh, uh, oxidized FID molecule. And this also is thought to be one of the processes that could underpin uh, magnetic sensitivity in cryptochromes. Well, in principle, the latter one, the one with the superoxide, is uh, at least under ideal conditions supposed to be way more sensitive than the flavin tryptophan radical pair, as it is uh, shown here, where the magnetic field uh, quantum beads are plotted as a function of time for the flavin Z, where Z is, is, is an idealized form of superoxide and the flavin tryptophan radical pair. And as you see, the two blue ones are more or less identical, whereas the two green ones, the ones involving superoxide, uh, are very much uh, distinct, meaning that this could indeed underpin uh, a sensitive compass, at least if operated under ideal conditions. However, conditions are not usually that ideal, uh, but uh, I will return to this point in just a second. Well, then with cryptochrome, in fact, the situation might even be more complex. Uh, and that's something that uh, we will probably be discussing during the, the meeting next week, where Adam is going to introduce to you this study where they did not use cryptochrome, but only the C-terminal tail, the tail that only comprises here 52 C-terminal amino acids of cryptochrome and still found magnetic field sensitive behavior here on the action potential firing in fruit flies or in, in, in larvae from, from, from uh, fruit fly larvae. Uh, well, and it seems thus that uh, as this does not comprise the FID binding domains and none of the uh, tryptophans that I've mentioned before, that maybe with cryptochrome the situation is, is more complex than we have uh, thought before, uh, or that at least in the fruit fly, there's an additional pathway for magnetosensitive behavior. Good, I will not discuss uh, about this uh, much more, but uh, would like to point out a review here that has recently been published by the Simon Group, where many different potentially radical pair-based reactions have been uh, suggested. So if uh, talking about biology, quantum biology, we ought not only focus on cryptochrome, but there are many other uh, processes like, for example, wound healing, hypermagnetic field effect on neurogenesis, uh, hypermagnetic field effect on microtube polyurganization, lithium effects on hyperactivity and so forth, where radical pair reactions have been implicated. Now, looking at which kind of radical pairs have been suggested, you will notice one thing, and that is, it's always involving superoxide, which is either combined with a flavin, like in cryptochrome, or a tryptophan, or, well, maybe a not yet known other radical uh, species. Which brings me to the next important point, namely, uh, are these biological environments uh, 
silent enough to allow this coherent spin dynamics to happen and to elicit magnetic field sensitivity. Well, you know, the problem is that uh, proteins in biology are not static. They are undergoing thermal motion, as is uh, indicated here, for, well, a cryptochrome from the plant. And we see here that the flowers inside of this cryptochrome are, are wiggling around, uh, and all this motion is inducing spin relaxation processes. That is, in other words, and, and Susanna is going to talk about this, I think, in a few days, we need to consider the dynamics of these uh, systems, not as a closed quantum system, but an open quantum uh, system, whereby relaxation effects become relevant. And if we do that, we'll find that any magnetic field effects, for example, anisotropic magnetic field effects due to the flower and tryptophan radical pair are strongly attenuated. For example, here from, well, say, uh, a value of 0.5% to a value of more or less than 0 0.1%. Uh, the characteristic time here is uh, the relaxation time. And this for cryptochromes has been found to be, uh, at least in theoretical studies, to be of the order of a microsecond, which is in principle long enough to allow magnetic field effect in the geomagnetic field, but just kind of at the border of where the sensitivity strongly drops. In other words, all these effects can only be expected to be really, really small. This is, however, an even bigger problem with uh, superoxide. Because superoxide is a very peculiar molecule, it has a degenerate uh, homor, a degenerate uh, uh, highest occupied molecular orbital, as you might know from the molecular orbit structure of oxygen. And this means that there is a non-zero orbital angular momentum in addition to the spin angular momentum. And this orbital angular momentum couples to the spin angular momentum. And the orbital angular momentum is furthermore strongly coupled to the motion of the, of the, of the superoxide, to its intrinsic rotation. And therefore, we have a very efficient relaxation pathway which is known as spin rotational relaxation, which is indicated here, where the anisotropic magnetic field effect without spin relaxation is strongly attenuated from a value of 5% to less than 0.04% due to uh, this spin rotational motion, due to the motion which is given by this equation here, which is proportional or indirectly proportional to the rotational correlation time. In other terms, the faster this molecule rotates, the faster it uh, relaxes. And what the spin relaxation means is uh, illustrated here, where I have once again considered the superoxide, uh, but applied a random field modulation as it would be induced by, uh, say, for example, the spin rotational interaction, which gives rise to spin relaxation on different time scales, namely 100 microseconds down to 0 0.1 microseconds. And you see in this scenario here, where we have fast spin relaxation, well, the spin here is kind of thrown around. It loses all the correlation with the other nuclear spin, uh, with the other electron spin in the second radical pair. And that means that we then only find one quarter of the radical pairs in the singlet state and three quarters in the triplet state uh, and no more magnetic field sensitivity to the weak, due to the weak applied um, magnetic field. So this is shown here once again for the flowering superoxide radical pair, this time for isotropic magnetic field effects and the singlet probability as a function of time in different applied magnetic fields. Without spin relaxation, we find this nice quantum oscillation, this quantum beats, uh, the hypermagnetic field scenario, zero microtesla is distinct from the geomagnetic field and is again distinct from higher uh, applied magnetic fields. But then if we apply spin relaxation, say at a uh, spin relaxation rate of one microsecond, well, the things become similar and we lose all these oscillations and eventually basically everything is gone and all these uh, spin dynamics look the same, meaning we don't have any magnetic field sensitivity anymore. Uh, in particular, keep in mind, that here I've assumed a relaxation rate of 20 microseconds, really tumbling superoxide, however, uh, will relax at a rate of uh, even, even faster than that. 
meaning with relaxation time of uh, less than five uh, nanoseconds. Good, there are ways around that. Uh, and we have, for example, suggested the three radical processes that involve a radical trio instead of a radical pair would be a mean to overcome uh, this kind of reaction, which, however, will uh, lead us too far off. However, uh, however, keep in mind that there are processes that would, even in the presence of infinitely fast spin relaxation in the superoxide, still allow for ample magnetosensitivity uh, and, for example, hypermagnetic field effects, as have been discussed in the context of neurogenesis. Good. Do I still have some time left, or am I, am I supposed to, to end here? Nathan, what's your judgment? I think you've got about 10 minutes to complete your hour, because I think we started about 20 past. Oh, perfect. So, so thank you, Susanna. That's good to know. In which case, I will say a few more words about uh, the low field effect. But before, before, in the context of uh, the plant cryptochrome, uh, I've referred to this peculiar feature that looked somehow like that, where the reaction yield showed this antiphase structure in weak magnetic fields. And in fact, all this search for the magnetic compass and radical pair reaction in weak magnetic field is somehow focused on this low field effect because it just expresses a peculiar sensitivity to very weak magnetic fields. But where does it come about? Well, before uh, addressing this, let me once again show you here the magnetic field sensitivity of a chemical reaction, this time of the flavin semiquinone ascorbyl radical, uh, radical pair. And we see here, uh, well, the canonical magnetic field effect. The canonical magnetic field effect, whereby the singlet yield is here reduced in the presence of a magnetic field that is approximately of the order of the hyperfine interactions in the radical pair. And this is, as we have discussed, due to, well, interconversion between singlets and all triplet states in the zero magnetic field, and only the singlet and the T0 state in the presence of an applied magnetic field. In even higher magnetic fields, then we see an additional change, which is due to the delta mechanism, which uh, uh, kind of gives rise to accelerated spin conversion in the stronger magnetic fields. Right, but then here, there is this. There it is, this low field effect. So where does this come about? Well, and the answer to that is that uh, there are certain symmetry uh, relations that apply in the absence of an applied magnetic field and in the presence of a weak magnetic field. In particular, in the zero magnetic field, uh, the total spin of the radical pair is conserved as well as its projection onto a preferred axis, whereby with total spin, I mean the sum of the electronic spin and the nuclear spin. And this quantity is preserved in zero magnetic field, but only partly in a weak applied magnetic field. In the weak applied magnetic field, the projection is conserved, whereas the total magnitude is not conserved. But this means that there are more pathways in the presence of a weak magnetic field that uh, interconvert singlet to triplet states, meaning that the reaction yield here can go up uh, and only then go down again as the applied uh, Seaman uh, field splits the states. This is uh, summarized here in, in a few words for uh, a radical pair that only couples to a single proton. For this radical pair, we can couple the singlet state with the proton to a total spin of one half, and we can couple the, the triplet state to spins of a total spin of one half and three halves. In the absence of an implied magnetic field, both these total spin quantum numbers and their projections are conserved. But in the presence of a magnetic field, this is no longer the case. Only MJ is conserved. But that means that we can, for example, induce transitions of this kind here, whereby an overall doublet state with J equals one half is converted into a triplet state whilst preserving the projection. This can, for example, be realized by converting S to T0 but not by converting S to T uh, plus minus. This gives rise then to uh, this nice magnetic field effect. 
Another way of looking at that is that we say we start out at the singlet state, we express the singlet state in the, the uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the system evolves, which gives rise to these kind of uh, contributions in the wave function. Eventually, we observe the singlet state, which uh, is obtained by evaluating here this probability, I mean, the probability that the final state projects onto the singlet state, which can be expressed as uh, follows. If this uh, system is then measured, then a simple way of accounting for this uh, chemical uh, measurement is by multiplying it with a recombination function and integrating, in which case every cosine term here is converted into a Lorentzian uh, of this form here. But if you look at this form here, well, that means that if you have situations where delta omega ij, the difference in the lama or in the precession frequencies of these two eigenstates uh, is zero because of a level crossing, but then you obtain a very sharp uh, spike in the singularity. And this is exactly what we uh, see in the low field effect. Uh, that is uh, for this radical pair, indeed we have this kind of level crossing in zero magnetic field. And if we take a ply magnetic field, we split it apart. Well, okay, that, that is something that was now more uh, oriented towards those that have already some kind of background in quantum mechanics. If that is not the case, do not worry, but uh, have a look at this figure here, which shows this low field effect as a function of the applied magnetic field. And what we see here for the simple radical pair is that provided that this radical pair is long lived, so provided that the rate constant here is relatively weak, we can see these enormous uh, low field effects uh, for radical pairs that are simple, namely one proton or two proton radical pairs, where this low field effect can even be larger than the high uh, field magnetic field effect. Uh, and here, this is a, a, a system that actually we have uh, measured. Uh, I think still uh, the largest, or uh, the system with the largest low field effect that has been recorded in an aqueous solution uh, namely for the flavin escobril system, which shows here this very nice uh, low field effect, which amounts to, well, I would say roughly 25% of the saturated magnetic uh, field effect. Uh, and that's really all I would like to say in this context. Good. Uh, eventually, maybe that's a good uh, topic to close. I could go on for longer, but probably you don't want that. Uh, let me let me close with this question. Namely, is the cryptochrome magnetosensitivity truly quantum? In the context of a quantum biological meeting, we must ask the question of, well, what is the source of quantumness in these kind of uh, processes? Well, radical pair spin dynamics is certainly quantum in a trivial sense, namely in the sense that uh, it involves spins. But that does not necessarily mean that there is anything peculiar or anything special or, or anything that uh, would deserve, well, quantum as a predicate of, of being, being more sensitive. Uh, and this question has been addressed uh, several times, for example, for the flavin tryptophan radical pair. And if you use this flavin tryptophan radical pair and increase its coherent lifetime, then what you observe is that in the direction magnetic field effect, this spike here emerges. And this spike here is interesting insofar as that it cannot be captured by a semi-classical theory. It cannot be understood in terms of the spin uh, that rotate around applied magnetic field that undergo this precession motion that I've shown you before, the semi-classical models. They just don't fail. And the reason that they fail is that this effect is due to an avoided crossing when the magnetic field is here in the plane of the FID. Uh, in this sense, this spike here could be considered a truly quantum feature of a cryptochrome. Another question that has been raised often is, does uh, entanglement uh, in radical pairs play a role? For example, the singlet state is uh, certainly one of the bell states, so it's a maximally entangled state, which suggests that maybe there is something uh, to, to be gained from this. Uh, and here we have kind of investigated this. Uh, here the right 
the plot shows negativity, which is a measure of uh, the entanglement, and the right plot here or the left plot here shows uh, measures of singlet triplet uh, coherence. And the point here is that indeed in simple model systems, you can conclude that negativity and thus entanglement is very important. But as soon as you consider more complex, more realistic models of radical pairs, this is no longer the case as shown here for a flavin set radical pair that comprises, uh, well, a large number of nuclear spins. Here, the negativity, the measure of entanglement immediately drops in less than 10 nanoseconds, meaning that the entanglement cannot contribute to the directional magnetic field sensitivity. Uh, this is a more recent study where we have looked at to find flowering radical pairs for all possible relative orientations of these two radicals and uh, found that interestingly, there is in fact a measure of global coherence that correlates with the compass sensitivity. And this suggests that it's not entanglement, but global coherence, meaning coherence that involves not only the electronic states, but also the nuclear spin states that uh, could underpin cryptochromes, magnetic field sensitivity. And I think with this uh, kind of concluding words, I would like to end. I could tell you more things about interradical interactions and uh, three radical effects. However, as the talk is on radical pairs, I think that would anyway uh, be beyond scope. Thus, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. Sorry, Nathan, that the, the rest was about things that you have done. Pardon me. The rest would have been about things that you have done. Oh, well, I mean, maybe next time. I, Good. I, can, I can mention them in my talk later this week. <laughs> uh, do we have questions before we move on? I'm looking through the chat. Margaret, are you here? Yes. Okay. I really am. Excellent. Well, thank you, Daniel, for a, a very engaging and detailed talk. It's, uh... oh, here we have a question. Uh, from Rasheen, do you think most cryptochrome species have similar magnetic sensitivity? Yes, I think so. I think most of them show this kind of underpinning uh, uh, magnetosensitivity in the photoreduction, provided certainly that they bind, bind FAD. Uh, and that is still a very open question for some of the species. For example, for the human cryptochrome one, uh, it's not that clear of whether it strongly binds FAD and whether that could give rise to similar dynamics. Uh, on the other hand, if we believe in, in the recent result by, by Adam and, and, and the work of, uh, and, and, and group, then yeah, bound FID might not even be necessary and even uh, lose interaction of, of say FID and, and uh, approaching fragment could be sufficient. But that's really something that uh, I think well, will only be, be known in a few years' time. And this is something I've wondered about. You mentioned the, the cryptochrome C terminal tail and these, these results showing that, that it seems only the C terminal tail is necessary. Could, could there be other fragments, not full cryptochromes, but flavins floating around that could inter interact with the C terminal tail alone to produce the result? What do you think of that? Well, as we have done a, a few studies on, of, of this already, uh, and my conclusion is that the C-terminal tail is basically a sponge for FAD. It binds FAD super strong. Huh. The reason for that is uh, that it has uh, electrostatic binding sites and also hydrophobic pockets where the FAD can interplay. Uh, and in a sense, um, I wouldn't rule out that other proteins can show this, this, this behavior in a similar way, but uh, at least in these molecular dynamic studies that we've undertaken, uh, 
it was kind of remarkable that uh, it can can interact that strongly and and and, and that irreversibly, so to say, uh, pick up uh, FAD from I'm, consumption. I'm... I'm almost imagining the the photolyze domain of cryptochrome at, and the FAD pocket as like a spacer then between the C terminal tail and the FAD. Yes, yes, but then the point is now is is the cryptochrome is the FAD uh, thus bound to the photolyze domain or is it actually bound to the C terminal side and the ah. when is more heat <laughs> sensitive? So yeah. so it kind of opened up a kind of kind of warmth. I guess so many more questions to to address. And then I guess I'll add, um, in, I mean, in light of the C-terminal tail question, of course, photolyase uh, is like cryptochrome, but has no C-terminal tail. Uh, you commented on whether all the cryptochromes would have similar magnetosensitivity. What about photolyase as a magnetosensor? Well, in, in, in principle, yes, there have been studies of photolyase as, uh, as, a, as a magnetosensor. But the problem is that photolyase has a ground state that doesn't uh, bind the deoxidized FAD. That is to say, uh, we start out mm. from the wrong side of the cycle, uh, but once chemically oxidized, it can undergo very similar dynamics and also form magnetosensitive uh, radical pairs. So it's not thought that this is, is relevant in, 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 in vivo. Well, thank you very much. This is very fascinating. And uh, I think if there's no more questions, without further ado, we'll move on to uh, Margaret's talk. So I'll be presenting her slides. Just allow me to bring them up. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, can you see this? Okay, yeah, I can see it. So I suppose everyone can. Great, Great it's here. Okay, so I'll just have to tell you to move the slides then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have to thank the organizers a lot for inviting me here uh, to this uh, first quantum biology meeting for this um, teaching talk. So uh, I, I got this vast topic of spin effects in biology, which would keep me going for a couple of months. And I thought uh, rather the, I rather limit myself to really the origin of our field, the beginnings of our field, the real foundations of this field of quantum biology, which was bird navigation. I may have time for a little more later on, but I think I'll, I'll just tell this wonderful story and uh, invite us all to remember why we're here. Okay, next slide. Next, next. So the field of bird navigation and indeed the field of quantum biology, the, the founders are Wolfgang and Rosita Wilchko in, from Frankfurt, Torsten Ritz from UC Irvine, who may be at the meeting, hopefully, and Christina Niesner. These are the people I'm, whose work has really founded the field and I'm going to talk about mostly. So next. Next. So um, let's start with the signal. What is the geomagnetic field? Well, it's because the Earth has a molten magnetic core, which is uh, sloshing around there in, in, in the deep pockets beneath our feet and creating a rather unusual feature, which is, of course, a geomagnetic field, which not that many planets have. And it's, uh, you know, it's characterized by magnetic field lines. I cannot use my pointer. Can I? Can you see it? Can you see my pointer? Oh, dear. I can see my pointer, but, but of course, your screen's not sharing. So I can oh, show. Dear. Okay, so I, I will have to speak extremely clearly. On the left, you can see the magnetic field lines um, from north to south. They're going down into the ground and up out of the ground. On the right, you can see a 
of what the actual signal that is perceived by the birds is likely to be. So the thing to keep in mind and never forget is that the magnetic field is a directional force. You actually have to be, so the bird that's underneath the arrows there, you actually have to be head on to the, field, the magnetic field lines in order to perceive the force. If you are, as the bird on the right is, is um, perpendicular, you actually will not perceive anything at all. So this is a very unique feature of the magnetic field, which makes magnetoreception so different from every other type of, uh, of reception. Uh, next slide. So the Wilch goes. How do you study this property in birds? And um, believe it or not, what they did, uh, these were animal behaviorists in Frankfurt, and I saw their lab and I, I tell you this is absolutely true. Every fall and every spring, they go out and catch birds. And of course, they don't do it with, an, with a, a thing like that. They have a net and they catch these poor little birds and then they bring them in to the lab and put them in nice cages and feed them lots of worms. And uh, these birds are, of course, in the middle of the spring or the fall migration. So all of the birds that they catch at these times of the year are desperate either to fly north if it is the um, uh, winter, uh, sorry, the summer, fall. No, what am I doing? Spring, they want to fly north. Fall, they want to fly south. That's called the magnetic field direction. So that's an innate property. And the Wilchgos absolutely catch these robins in order to study magnetic field effects. Next, next slide. Next, uh, next, yeah. So how to study these field effects? Um, when Wolfgang Wilschko was a graduate student, like many of you, hopefully, his project was bird behavior and it was not magnetic fields, but his next door neighbor was studying magnetic properties of some metal or other. And so he had it in his mind, the thought of magnetic fields. And he came up with a strategy as a student to put a bird, in a funnel so it couldn't see any direction and put on the right hand side you see a paper a round paper there where the bird because it wants to migrate it scratches on the paper in the direction that it wants to migrate and those scratch marks are that pale region on that uh, paper on the bottom right so the bird wants to fly in a certain direction and you can actually count the number of times it scratches the paper in the direction it wants to fly. And that is the beginning of quantum biology. So we need to humbly acknowledge our origins. We were, we, we developed from a bird scratching a piece of paper because next slide. What Wolfgang Wilchko then decided to do, he had the idea, maybe, maybe these birds are using the magnetic field to orient. It was just an idea of a graduate student, how to test it. Well, he had the assay, he could put the bird in the funnel. No, go, go, go back, stop. Uh, you see on the top right, there is a big magnetic coil. You see it on the, the top right of the slide. And you can put that big magnetic coil around the funnel. So on the left, the circle on the left, you see a circle with north, south, west, and east. And you see a lot of triangles pointing north. This, this was taken with birds that were captured in the, in, the, in the spring. And they wanted to go north. And they scratched the funnel on the north. And what Wolfgang Wilchko did is he put these, this funnel in that magnetic coil you see on the top right. He turned it so that the magnetic north was artificially directed in a southerly direction. I mean, the birds could not see anything, but the field had been moved so that it was pointing east, south, east. And as you can see by the triangles, they all scratched in the direction of the new magnetic field. 
So this, this was the historical finding. I still remember Wolfgang talking about this at length, where he, you know, at that time, he observed the birds hopping in the, in the direction they were scratching. So he actually stood there counting the hops. And he said, you know, when the hops got to 100 hops in the southerly direction, he knew he had it. So imagine your whole career set out, laid out for you as a graduate student from one experiment, from one idea, and it, 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 was, it was historic. So sorry, I have to tell you these things. Next, next slide. So now, because of this very beautiful, elegant, and clear, mostly a clear assay for magnetic field, it was possible to determine some of the characteristics, the unique characteristics of the avian magnetic compass. And one of these is that it has a functional window. So what is a functional window? If you look at the graph on the left with the bird flying there, and you look on the, on the x-axis, you see the intensity before the test. You see this, these are the um, magnetic field intensities. Can you point to number four on the bottom, that number four? These were birds, yeah, on the bottom, yeah, yeah. these were birds that had been adapted to a magnetic field intensity of four micro Tesla. You can do that. You put them in a coil, you compensate the Earth's field. They had been grown and fed at four micro Tesla for a couple of days. Four micro Tesla, that's one tenth of the local Earth's Earth field. But when they were put in, the, in that funnel and oriented, and that four micro Tesla was oriented in the migratory direction, those birds were able to tell. So this tells you the amazing perception that's possible. However, if you go to you know, the middle section at 40, you see 46, you see all those negatives there and then a couple of positives and then more negatives at increasing intensity. This is because the birds that had been stored, I mean grown at 46 micro Tesla had been left at Earth's magnetic field, grown and fed. They only responded to a change in direction that was something equivalent to the magnetic field strength that they were used to. That's what is called a functional window. If you take a bird that has been adapted to 46 micro Teslas, you put it in a coil that orients the field in, in the direction they want to go, but at four micro Tesla, they will not respond. Not because they can't, but because they have not been adapted. That is that they have the capacity, but it requires adaptation. And I think I'm helped by some of your former talks because I think you actually deal with the theoretical basis for this. So it's kind of nice to be last in this series. So, but, but this was totally an empirical observation. And as you can see, as the magnetic field strength increased to 92 to 150, the birds were able to orient if you, if you moved the magnetic field and pointed it at that intensity, but not any other. So um, that's what's meant by the functional window. Next, next slide. Another very, very critical feature of the magnetic, uh, the, the orientation behavior of birds is that they respond to an inclination compass. So I'm sorry, I know for some of you it's a review, but I think it's important now, especially today where we tend to jump ahead into reactions to get back to the actual phenomena. Why is this important? Because in fact, you know that there's a north and a south pole and that uh, metal, for example, there's a well-known compass of bacteria, which is based on metal uh, particles called magnetite, always points in a northerly direction. It's like your compass, your pocket compass. This is a this is a, a mechanism that has nothing to do with the radical pair mechanism. It has nothing to do with spin chemistry. It is simply a property of metals and the geomagnetic North Pole. So it was very interesting to find that the birds did not really care about North and South Pole. What the birds were looking at was the actual angle 
so you you can see on this globe that the arrows are going downwards on the northern hemisphere they're coming up on the southern hemisphere so on the northern hemisphere you might the birds would point towards the equator they would know that a certain angle of the magnetic field lines is pointing towards the equator but if you took that very same bird to the southern hemisphere which the wilchkos did and you put it in the southern hemisphere and asked it where did it want to go it would not just continue in the direction that it would have gone in the north it would actually go along the lines of the angles of inclination which are pointing from the groundwards up and it would have gone also towards the equator they actually did this experiment they um made they, they they traveled with the birds and released them in the southern hemisphere and bang they went in the right direction so that's a complicated way to show it the other way of course is using the magnetic coil simply change the angle of inclination of the field and you see the birds totally do not care they care only what is the angle they do not care which is north and south so this is a very important feature of the avian compass and a very theoretically difficult one to explain and in fact that was the thing i think more than anything that led to the idea there must be some unknown mechanism involved you know, stimulating klaus schulten and as we heard and mostly of course torsten ritz next slide so uh these characteristics gave rise to this the idea that there might be a spin ke chemical process and it was ritz torsten ritz and klaus schulten in 2000 who proposed the radical pair mechanism for bird navigation that was really torsten's contribution to this idea and then uh you know a fate so had it the wilsch goes heard about this these are animal behaviorists they don't know an atom from an electron i mean they are not physicists but they knew that unless they had a way to explain navigation it would never become accepted as a true mechanism and so they got together with torsten ritz the uh, next slide i'm not sure torsten's on this call if you are torsten i hope i'm not mangling your uh, topic here so this this led then to the to the theoretical concept of a radical pair model of magneto reception in birds and um the beauty is you've all heard of this now so i don't have to go into much detail um basically if you look on the upper left you can see light which so this was the original concept which has now changed i have to say a little bit but the original concept is not that far off it requires light which which interacts with a receptor to generate a radical pair which is which is split into singlet um so opposite spin singlet state and the effect of the magnetic field you you can point if you want but i i'm i'm hoping everyone understands this so when a when a photoreceptor is is um, absorbing a photon of light it undergoes a chemical reaction the magnetic field can interact with that chemical reaction by affecting electron spin by the beautiful mechanisms we've heard of and the end result from a biological point of view which is mine is that the yield you know the product the the output of the receptor will change based on the presence of the external magnetic field so if a photoreceptor is involved it means that that photoreceptor will see and in quotations the light in a more or less efficient way and this is something that a biologist can relate to and understand as a magnetic field effect it's a lot easier for us than electron spins. So uh, I can't go into the eye here. I'll talk about that later. Next, next slide. So this this was the you know this uh, coming together of theoretical physicist Torsten Ritz and the world's top behavioral 
biologists, experimentalists on uh, migratory birds. And they put their heads together and asked, is there a way experimentally using biology, using bird navigation to prove that this radical pair mechanism might actually be real? And when I say real, I mean it has to have biological significance. Next, 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 next. So we get back to quantum theory. And I do not ask me what this formula is, but somebody said it's relevant. So we've we heard a little bit about this already, that quantum theory predicts that radio frequency RF fields of a certain frequency should interfere with the spin chemistry of magnetoreception. So next slide. So from a biological perspective, it means that if, if you have a magnetic field effect, so if your birds are orienting to a magnetic field at a certain intensity direction, and you apply a radio frequency field of a certain frequency, you should be able to disorient the birds. In practical terms, that is what we biologists need to see. If it's real, it will disrupt magnetosensing in the birds. So I don't go through this in detail. I think you heard already quite a bit on it. Next, on to the experiments. So this is what the Wilchkos actually did. They took their classic assay, their, their beautiful and very powerful assay. And you see on the left on number A, the earth field, you can see the, the behavior of the birds, uh, the orientation of the birds, they all want to fly south. So this is in the, um, this, this is in the, the fall, they're going to fly south. And they're all scratching the triangles, the black triangles, they're all scratching the cage on the bottom part. Now in the press on panel B, you can see B beside it. You see that uh, the, they applied a magnetic field of seven, a radio frequency field of seven megahertz. It was uh, very weak. It was 490, I think, uh, nano Tesla. So much, much weaker than the magnetic field. And you can see from the random pattern of the triangles that the birds were completely disoriented they could not find their direction. On the right, it's much more dramatic. The top panel shows the response to the earth field. Now they're flying north. This was in the spring. Um, panel B and C both show the response of the birds in the funnel to a magnetic, to an applied radio frequency field of 1.3 megahertz. And as I think, um, Daniel told us this is close to the Larmor frequency. This is the predicted, theoretically predicted frequency that should interfere with um, low navigation, with, with the, the geomagnetic field perception. And they were able to go down to intensities of 15 nanotesla. That is just so vanishing. And the data showed that the birds were completely disoriented. There has been some debate about this data. I have to say it's been replicated in two in different labs independently. So I think it, it is solid. So this next slide. So this is powerful evidence. Again, behavioral evidence, biology. This is what we call real evidence that quantum phenomena must be involved because how else do you explain such a tiny force affecting bird navigation is impossible. And that was published in first by Torsten Ritz and the Wilch goes in nature in 2004. So uh, next slide, please. So now we get to the Nate, what is the nature of the magnetoreceptor? And we heard a lot about this, but humor me. And I think let's, let's enjoy again the journey that they took, which is uh, at the time there was really no hint. I mean, nobody really had much of an idea because in fact, very few of the known photoreceptors in birds form radical pairs. The opsins do not. And those are the ones that are known to be involved in vision. So I mean, what, what could it be? It has to be some other pigment. Next slide. And 
Torsten Ritz was the one who first suggested cryptochrome. So in, in a real sense, he is the founder of our field. I mean, absolutely brilliant stroke of genius. I mean, this was, this was his suggestion completely that all of these effects might be due to a photoreceptor that had been identified in plants of all places. Next, next slide. So cryptochromes, um, to give you the bio biological background of them, they were identified in plants and they were actually involved in growth and development of plants. So they are plant blue light photoreceptors. If you look in the middle, you see that uh, they have a protein backbone to which is bound flavin in the middle, which is the active, catalytically active cofactor. The flavin is what allows the cryptochromes to absorb light. And in plants, what they do is they allow plants to flower, to germinate, to ripen, to do all kinds of plant stuff in response to blue light. Next. Now, uh, very early on, it became clear that cryptochromes were also found throughout the biological kingdom, including in man. Next. And I'm going to digress here. I, I don't have time to really talk about all these beautiful phenotypes of cryptochrome that are magnetically sensitive. But in fact, when the Wilchkos first, when Torsten and the Wilchkos first proposed cryptochrome as a putative magnetosensor, a lot of the people studying cryptochromes jumped. They said, what? Our photoreceptor is a magnetoreceptor? And they used the power of the biological system, the genetics of the biological system, to be to look and see whether plants and flies and mild, mouse mouse um, they didn't do mouse plants and flies basically could respond to magnetic fields through cryptochrome, and the answer was yes. You see small differences in left plant growth and flowering in the presence of an applied magnetic field. And in the case of Drosophila, there are quite a few chain uh, phenotypes, which I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about at the meeting. But one of them is that the, the magnetic field is able to alter the circadian rhythms, which are cryptochrome dependent and blue light dependent. So this, this indirectly su supported the idea of Torsten who came up with the, the flash that it may be cryptochrome. Next. But the definitive experiment in the birds to try to approach the, to try to understand the identity of the magnetosensor was a light, oh, time is running out. Okay, I better talk quicker. Um, it was to look at light sensitivity. So here again, these are beautiful classic experiments which have largely uh, become forgotten, where the Wilch goes, they did this, they put the birds in the funnel under different light conditions. And if you look on the top line, you see that in the in UV, blue, turquoise, uh, you can point to it, maybe green. Yeah, the birds are perfectly able to sense the magnetic field, but in yellow and red, they are not. So the bird orientation required short wavelength light. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. So that um, the conclusion was that the birds would need blue green light, you know, which is to orient. Next slide. We're not going to go into this now. So could cryptochromes explain the wavelength specificity? Now here I have the plant cryptochrome on the left, the protein structure on the right. Uh, as we heard, so I can go a bit quickly, cryptochromes, this plant and drosophila, the light sensing cryptochromes undergo redox reactions. So they, the dark form is oxidized. Can you point, just point to the cycle? The dark form is oxidized. Blue light induces the radical state. So the radical redox state. And then blue plus green light from the radical will induce the fully reduced redox state. That redox state is spontaneously in the dark reoxidized in the presence of molecular oxygen to form oxidized flavin. So you have a redox cycle of different flavin states 
And one of them, the semiquinone flavin radical, absorbs blue plus green light. Next. So the wavelength spectrum is there. So here is another feature of the cryptochrome photocycle, which you need to grasp. This is again the plant cryptochrome photocycle. So on the left, on the left, you see the, the inactive state, which is the dark, dark state, which absorbs blue light only. It's oxidized. Then it is activated into the neutral radical. So if you move the arrow, redox state. But what's important also is that you see the C terminal domain flipping out. You see a conformational change in the receptor. This is how plant cryptochromes are activated. They change their conformational state and they interact with partner proteins and they do growth and development and a lot of wonderful things. The other feature of this photocycle is if you look at the back reaction, so from FADH dot or FADH minus, you can see that in, in the back reaction, cryptochromes consume molecular oxygen. So they're consuming oxygen. They're producing oxygen radicals, reactive oxygen. And the end product of the reaction is hydrogen peroxide. So cryptochromes also generate reactive oxygen radicals in the course of their redox cycle. These, these two things are elements and features of how cryptochromes work. Next slide. So what did the Wilchkos do? Well, first of all, it was really clear that the wavelength spectrum, you know, the green-blue um, navigation spectrum, it fit because the semi-reduced flavin of cryptochrome, which is circled in red on the bottom panel, the absorption you can see is in the blue and the green. It fits with navigation. The second thing, next slide, that the Wilchkos did, which I think is really important to understand, is they had a reflection on which avian cryptochrome is it? So this is a very important question. In fact, as I said, cryptochromes are a large gene family. And in birds, there are no less than five family members which have been found in the bird's eye. And they're also localized throughout the body. So they do lots of different things, but there's five of them in the bird's eye. Which one is it? Next slide. Next slide. So this is the family tree. And I've circled in red on top the type 2 cries, which are the type of cries which are found in humans and which are, which are theorized as the, pos the only possible magnetically sensitive cryptochrome in bird's eye. So it's a human type cry we're talking about. A little lower down in brackets, you see other types of cries, type 4 cry, type 1 cry, and Drosophila plant cry. All of these have been surmised or shown to have magnetically sensitive effects. But in birds, the type, the Wilchko's hypothesized it's a type 2 cry. Next. Next. So, and the reason for this reflection is that there were only really based on the localization. This is all based on localization. In the bird's eye, there are really only two possibilities. There's only cry 1a or cry 4. Because these, these are the only cryptochromes which are localized within the outer segments of photoreceptive cells of the retina. They're the only ones that are positioned to produce a visual signal to the bird. So it was narrowed down to those two. Next, 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 next. Now I talk about CRY4 because, uh, you know, big, big papers and lots and lots of papers have been written about them. And I think it's important that we look at, we examine the evidence here. So next one, next slide. So first, first of all, there's a, a major problem with CRY4. It is localized in a part of the bird's eye uh, called the double cones. And this part of the bird's eye contains oil droplets. All of you photobiologists or perhaps chemists know that oil blocks UV. You cannot explain, and you see the, the circle I drew around the left most, um, on the left side, yeah, this, this is um, bird navigation under UV light. 
birds navigate under UV light. So if if the avian, you know, they 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 are oriented under UV light. They are able to sense the magnetic field under UV light. They cannot do that if cry four was the magnetosensor because it would not be able to absorb UV. This is a this is a very powerful argument here. You cannot get around it. You have to have something which physically could possibly respond to the signal. And if it does not in the bird, no theory can overcome the factual impossibility. Uh, and furthermore, robins are five times as sensitive to UV as they are to any other type of light. So it really does not fit. Next. So the other, the other reason that cry four is um, eliminated as a putative magnetoreceptor is that it is not one of these sensory cryptochromes. You know that it's a, it's a large gene family, cryptochrome photolyase. And we heard a little bit from Daniel at the end of the last talk that photolyases, they don't have a photocycle. The flavin is in, maintained in the reduced state in vivo, and they do not undergo any type of uh, biological activation by light in a signaling, as a signaling molecule. Well, it happens, so on the left and under B, I've copied the data for the chicken cry four, which is very similar to the robin cry four. And it shows that if you isolate the protein and you reduce it, it takes up to four hours for that reduced protein to reoxidize. You cannot have a photosensory mechanism which takes four hours to reset. It is simply not a photosensor. So this, this is the other line of, of, um, of data which needs to be taken into account. Next. So um, yeah, so this, this is another way of explaining it. The avian cry four under conditions of kin continuous illumination would simply convert to the fully reduced. So I have it circled in red. You would get the entire protein in the fully reduced redox form. And this would not support a photocycle and could not explain cryptochrome navigation as we currently propose it. Next. So I, I say it rather forcefully because it, it, uh, we keep seeing papers coming out about this and people keep accepting this. And I, I'm very frustrated that nobody ever looks at the data because it is impossible. So now you've seen it and now I've given you the references. So next, next slide. So what is left is now, what about CRY1A? You know, this is, what is the evidence or is there any evidence that this could be involved in magnetosensing? Next slide. So I want to show you again, the beautiful, beautiful work that the Wilchkos did. This is now histochemical evidence. So again, as I told you, it is really important that the putative magnetosensor is localized in a structure which is A, involved in magnetosensing, and B, able to respond to the signals that are involved in magnetosensing. So in this case, on the left, you see a, um, a vertebrate rod. That's a vertebrate rod cell, which has been sectioned. And so in each of these panels, you see a, you're seeing a section of that and in the upper panel, um, it cry one A, the green fluorescence is due to an antibody that specifically stains cry one A. Now, in the UV vis cone, the the blue. So in the middle panel, they are staining opsin UV vis cone opsin. So this is an opsin that is specific to the UV vis cone. And in the last set merged, which looks turquoise. You see that both of the, because it's turquoise means that both of these receptors are in the exact same location. It puts the CRY1A exactly in the right photoreceptor cell for magnetic sensitivity. And that is not the case for CRY4. Next. Okay. So, um, Next, I have to really express my 
excitement about the, these data, which were done by Christina Niesner in the Wilchko lab, who actually was able to histochemically address the question, what is the avian cry1a response to light? Can you, so imagine this, you, you come to an animal behavior lab, you yourself have never done histochemistry. The question your boss puts in front of you is he says, I think it's cryptochrome, but I want proof. And I also want some proof that this protein responds to light in the way, in exactly the same way the birds do. So for the students sitting in the audience, I think this is a, a good shaking up as to what PhD projects should be, because she came up with a, a strategy to solve it. And so how, how, how can you probe the activation state of a cryptochrome in living tissue using, using simply histochemical methods? Next. So here we come back again to the actual redox sensitive mechanism that I showed you before for the plant cryptochrome. I'm really sorry, you have to do all the pointing. On the top panel, you see that in the inactive state, flavin is oxidized, then it is reduced by light. In the case of the robin cry or the bird cry, both blue and green light can activate cryptochrome. So we presume that the active state is the fully reduced redox state. On the bottom panel, you see what happens to the C-terminal domain. The C-terminal domain under the inactive cryptochrome is in a closed conformation. It's in a closed conformation, but in the active state on the bottom right, see it? You see how that C-terminal flips out? That is a conformational change triggered by light. It's been observed in the plant cry. It's been observed in the Drosophila cry. And the prediction, so this is where the, the insight came. If that change, they thought, they thought about this. They said, well, if that change is happening in the bird cry, then it means that the antibody, if we raise an antibody specifically to the C-terminal domain, it should only bind to the light activated form. You, you understand why? Because the light activated form, the C terminus is flipped out. It's accessible to antibody. In all the other forms, it's not. Next slide. Next, 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 next. So this is another way of saying it. The, the Wilchko lab made an antibody to the C terminal domain of the Cry1A. And then they took chickens, a very sad story, but they took live little chicks and also a few live robins. And they illuminated them and then they sacrificed them and they, they took out the retina and they did histochemical staining. Next slide. Next slide. And this was the result. So what I show, so each of these panels is a section, all six of them are sections of the retina of these chicks, these chicks, I think, um, who, who were exposed to light and then stained. So on the top, the top three panels, you see UV, blue, and turquoise. Those green spots are staining of Cry1A antibody. And in the inset, you see that white circle with the, with the behavioral image. That shows the behavioral response of the birds to this type of light. They're oriented in these qualities of light. And you can see that each of these qualities of light also activates the cry. Except for red light, in the case of red light and yellow, the birds are not oriented and the staining is absent, much reduced or absent. So next slide, please. So, um, this this was um, I'm I'm really taking too long here, so I, I I'll hurry up a bit. So, but it's such a beautiful story, and it is really how our whole field grew. So somebody can tell it, has to tell it here. So we know now that the cryptochrome, and there's only one possible Cry1A. This is not proof that, by the way, I'm not saying that this is proof that it's a cryptochrome or that it is Cry1A. But it is proof that it cannot be, if it is a cryptochrome, it cannot be any other one. That is proof. 
So what about, so the next question is orientation. Now here is a real problem. Um, next slide, next slide. If you remember, um, right at the beginning, I told you the magnetic field is unique in that forces, in that it has a directional component. If you're parallel, you will feel it, but if you're not, you will not. And the only way that you can perceive a directional signal is if your receptor is also oriented. This was being a stumbling block for more than 30 years for the Wilchkos. So they finally um, did an e, e electron micrograph staining of Cry1A in the same retinal cell, that uh, photoreceptor cell that I just showed you before. And so the, the section is on the left. In the middle, you see those little spots. Each of those spots is staining of antibody of Cry1A. And you see these flat, flat stacks. These flat stacks are oriented membranes with the cry interpolated. So amazingly in the bird's eye, these cryptochromes, at least they have one degree of orientation. I mean, I wouldn't say they're in a lattice or anything like that, but it could, it is enough to explain a directional effect. Next slide. So next we get to what's already been talked a lot about at this um, with the other two speakers. I'll go more quickly. So we have a cryptochrome. It's in the right place. It responds to the right type of light. And moreover, it's in an oriented situation where it could be a magnetosensor. But how? What could be the mechanism? Next. And here is the cryptochrome photocycle that you've already seen, the, the three different redox states of Flavin. You see that blue light triggers Flavin photoreduction. And you see also that there's a reoxidation reaction, which, so it's a circle, you know, forward by light and reverse by oxygen. And that's how the cycle is restored. And there are two places where it is known that radical pairs can be generated in this photocycle. There are only two known. I mean, there could be unknown, but two are known. One of them I circled in red on top is the trip Flavin radical pair that we've heard a lot about and that keeps, for reasons, it keeps being published everywhere. And so I'm going to deal with it a little bit more um, rigorously. And the other possible radical pair that we know of is through the reoxidation reaction on the bottom circled, which is a light independent step and which does not involve direct action of light. Next slide. So the prediction, I mean, how weak magnetic fields should affect cryptochrome is by changing the, 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 the rate constants. You see there are rate constants, K1, K2, K1B, K2B. If you change any of these rate constants by a magnetic field, you will change the, the average biological activity of the receptor and you will get a different, a, this, the bird will perceive it as a difference in the light intensity. So it's enough if either one of these reactions is magnetically sensitive to give you directional sensing. So let's look at K1 next. next. K1, uh, what is the correct one? So let's look at that, the trip flavin radical pair next. Next. So here, this is the question a biologist asks. There are beautiful data in the test tube that that reaction responds to externally applied magnetic fields. You get a greater or lesser product yield when you, you, know, you can study it, you can measure it. The question is, do the birds use it? Next. Um, and so here, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a pointer, but you see, you, I, I show you here the reaction on top. From, the reaction involves transition from oxidized to radical flavin. That is the reaction step. And that is forming trip radicals and flavin radical pairs. It is, can only happen at that step. Now, on the bottom is a, a spectrum. Uh, a light's absorption spectrum of oxidized flavin. And if you see the solid line in the graph, just trace out, uh, Nathan, the solid line, the solid trace in the graph underneath, yeah. That is the spectrum of oxidized 
Flavin. Can you see that it a, has a sharp cutoff at 500, that there is no absorption in the green or, or yellow? This is a property of all flavins in the universe, okay? There are no exceptions. Now, oxidized flavin does not absorb green light. This is a physical fact, people. Next. Next, next slide. Let us take a look again at the wavelength sensitivity of birds. You see I circled in red the trace where the bird has been measured its navigation in green light. It's perfectly navigated. It's very happy under that condition. It is impossible, impossible to explain this through a mechanism that's using the trip flavin radical pair. That should not be mentioned, that, that should not be proposed. The, the behavioral, the biological evidence contradicted. And you know what the Wilchkos would say, the bird is, you know, you have a beautiful idea, works in the test tube, you can make fancy papers, beautiful models, but the bird is always right. Bird said, no, no, I don't need that. I can or or orient just as well. Next, next slide. So, uh, you know, of course, there's some, some, some unhappiness with that. So I, I cite a, a dozen papers showing that, yes, birds orient in green light. It's been shown with many different labs. Next. Um, so I say it again. It's said, let's go, let's move on. Move on, move on. So now we are left with, again, this is a known possibility. I am very open to unknown possibilities, but this is the other other known possibility. Daniel talked about it a little bit. I'm not going to go into it very much because he mentioned the beautiful experiments that were done. Carry on. Next slide. So the flickering light experiment that Daniel mentioned, the thing I want to also explain, you know, which is often forgotten, is there is a real difference in um, time for the forward reaction, when you're talking about the light induced, you know, the flavin reduction, that reaction happens in microseconds, milliseconds at the most. It is really, really fast. But the restoring, resetting the cryptochrome from its active state back to its inactive is slow. It takes minutes. In some cases, it, it never happens at all. As you know, in photolias, it doesn't happen at all. That is a place, that step is a, a point in the pathway where many things can affect rate. Temperature, for example, temperature will affect that reaction. Um, pH will affect it a lot. Um, midpoint potential of the cell will affect it. It's actually an ideal um, step at which you can control cryptochrome using all kinds of different mechanisms. And so in a way, it shouldn't be a surprise that the magnetic field effect can also take advantage of the fact that this takes a lot of time and it happens independently of light. So the next slide. So the flickering experiment that um, Daniel talked about is that, again, this was done by the Wilchkos in, in these cages. They put the birds in, but instead of putting the, the light on at the same time as the magnetic field, which is what was done with every other experiment they ever did, if you look at the upper right panel, can you see that? You see my magnets? No, upper right, yeah. You see the magnets on top and you see the light? So it says T and then you have the magnet. You have T and then you have the magnet. What that means is that the light was on for 300 milliseconds switched off, a, a time of 10 milliseconds to 60 was weighted, and then the magnet was switched on. So they were actually able to turn on the magnet independently of the light. And as you can see from those two um, circles on the bottom, the turquoise and the green, the data shows the birds were very happily oriented. Does you know, for the it's another thing, a nail in the coffin of this trip flavin radical pair mechanism, that 
triplavin radical pair lasts at most. I think the longest I've seen anywhere was maybe 30 milliseconds, something like that. There is no possible way you can explain this kind of data with that, that radical pair lingering on into the dark phase of the reaction. So I, I don't show my other data in plants. I want to focus on this work of the Wilchko's. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, I just circled that the radical, you know, the magnetically sensitive step occurs in the dark. And here again, I want to get back to the original paradigm by Torsten Ritz and everyone who works on this, that the idea that the radical pairs are formed by the light. It's a beautiful concept. It is not false to the extent that you need light. You need light in order to generate to set the system going. But in fact, the radically, the you know, the magnetically sensitive radical pairs are not formed by light directly. And I think this is an important point also to explain some of the odd things that are starting to come out, you know, like with the C-terminal domain of the Drosophila cry being magnetically sensitive. Light is important for cry because it sets the cycle going. But actually, anything that can interact with a protein and generate reactive oxygen, in principle, could generate radical pairs for that that might be magnetically sensitive. So I think our paradigm, this, this fits nicely with the new data, and it also helps to explain the phenomenon of bird navigation. Next slide. So I summarize it in this way. The magnetically sensitive step people occurs in during in the course of this reaction for the cryptochromes. Now, I, I hear Daniel that he says Flavin sticks to these domains. I think it's not just that simple that any Flavin can float in and make a um, physiologically meaningful magnetic magnetosensor, but perhaps this was the origin of that. And the cryptochrome developed around these C-terminal domains to maintain the reaction and to have it in a reversible form where it was good for signaling. So next, next, uh, next point. So although light is needed to activate bird cry, the magnetically sensitive step occurs in the dark and furthermore seems to be a conserved feature of spin chemical processes that alter biological activity. Next slide. So bird navigation I, I can be understood in terms of the radical pair mechanism. I still say if there's no proof that cryptochrome is involved, but if it is involved, the spin chemistry involves reactive oxygen and not the trip uh, triad flavin radical pair mechanism. And I think, you know, First, there are a couple of, uh, I, I hope I don't sound too preachy. I, I'm just, I think there are a couple of lessons to be learned from this, the Wilchko story. First of all, the brilliance, you know, that with just a few simple tools, they were able to come out with this very complex, um, detailed description of magnetic orientation to the point of even making some predictions about the, the radical pair. I mean, that, that is unbelievable from behavioral data alone and, and, and histochemistry. So, so I, the, the, they founded this field and we, we have to try to follow that. But the second thing, which I think in an interdisciplinary field like this often gets lost is that it's easy to study phenomena which are neat, exciting, yield nice data um, in the test tube. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily just because something looks good in vitro that it has any relevance in vivo. And the in vivo data has to drive the interpretation of the in vitro stuff. Other, you can never get a theory good enough to go and convince the bird that that's how it orients. It is not going to listen to you. Your theory has to fit 
what it does. And I think some of that is lost. Um, so I, I, I won't go any further with that, but it's, as a biologist, that's what I, I notice because it, it, it tends to be lost when, when the data looks too beautiful. Next, next, final, final. So here is so here I thought I'd finish with something fun, which is what is a bird? What, what does a bird see? How does he see quantum theory? You know, what, what is a bird actually seeing? Well, he's got his head either towards the field or perpendicular to it. And in his eye, he's got a blue light receptor, which is either less or more powerful. So you see the spot is either dimmer or brighter depending on which way his head is turned. So all these complex calculations, experiments, um, you know, theories, arguments, papers, and all that we're, we're doing to understand this phenomenon, all the bird has to do is turn its head. And it knows exactly what is the state of the quantum environment. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry about the length. Uh, that was wonderful. I, I mean, I, I think as speaking only for myself, I'm very grateful for the depth of your uh, discussion. Well, Are you taking questions? Are you taking a couple uh, of questions? I'm still here. I'm still here. I mean, I, I imagine everyone else is going, but <laughs> I'm... So, I'll be so, at so, the meeting, by the way, so you can all gang up on me. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm going to have my headgear on, and you know, I'll, I'll be there, body armor and everything. So, <laughs> I think this is, this is going to be a really fun occasion to, to, to re, to debate these things. But so go we are, so, so we are starting uh, with our. Um, small group work at 10 30 by when we we're, we're going to switch to to um okay you got five minutes you got five minutes so feel free to to log off and also since margaret is here and is willing to and to answer questions feel free to ask margaret oh, yes. questions too <laughs> questions to margaret in the chat maybe i talked too much no, but it, it's such a beautiful story. I, I, I could go on. You know. Okay, I have a question in the go chat. Yeah, go for it. Um, we have a question uh, that says, um, is cryptochrome similar to photolyze in that there is a second photosensitive ligand that absorbs at a different wavelength? I have only studied the former. Good, good, uh, good question. In fact, some, fo some cryptochromes do have cryptochromes on, in, in quotations, because in, in fact, it's most cryptochromes as designated cryptochromes are known as photolyase-like proteins, which do not repair DNA. So the actual function is not known if they have any function, but there are several families of them that do have this extra pigment, including the cry-dash cryptochromes, for example. Photolyases, let me expand on this. Photolyases need the antenna pigment. Do you know why? Because they only work with the flavin in the reduced state. And reduced state flavin does not absorb light. If the photolyase doesn't have an antenna, it is blind, practically blind. I suppose there's a little peak in the UV from the flavin. Does that help? I, yeah, I found that very clear. Okay. I, we have a question about the uh, functional window. Yes. Uh, is there a, a paper that you could recommend about the functional yes, window? Yes, I can. Uh, it's in 2015, a Journal of the Royal Society Interface. Wilch goes, our signs have signed it. Um, I think you can find it easily if you just Google Wilchko Journal of the Royal Society Interface 2015, and it'll be in there. It's also in their recent review in the Frontiers article in 2021. So Frontiers in Physiology 2021 Wilchko. They talk about the functional window. Okay, I put this in the chat. We have a next question. 
um, asking how different cryptochromes, uh, pardon me, how are cryptochromes different from uh, fluorescent proteins uh, like GFP, et cetera? And I think this is the question I've asked you myself before, Margaret. They do not fluoresce efficiently at all. They are the most highly quenched individuals known to mankind. Uh, they, they, they will, you know, I think they will fluoresce, obviously, but it's simply a totally inefficient process. So um, I think that's my answer. They, 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 they in f physical terms do, but in real terms, they and, don't. And, so, so, sorry to interrupt, but I have a follow-up question. What's your answer to like, where should we look for proteins that can sustain spin-dependent chemical reactions? Any flavor there... protein, any flavor protein, any flavor what, what else? protein that undergoes what, what else? redox chemistry, any flavor protein that undergoes redox chemistry. The reason we do not see, the reason we don't, you know, we're all crypto, I'm, I'm a cryptochrome file, but the reason that cryptochrome is a good candidate is because it happens to be a signaling molecule. So any small change in its function, you can detect. But, you know, I didn't get to the second part of my talk, which clearly if there was no time for, but I would have talked to you about mammalian cell cultures, because there, there is clear evidence for magnetic field effects on mitochondrial enzymes. These are spin chemical effects. There's beautiful evidence for radio frequency effects and all of these, even for functional windows, by the way. And they do not, in, some of them do involve cryptochrome, but not all. And so there, I think the reason we do not see it is because a small change in mitochondrial function will not register. You know, if you're, if you're measuring plant growth, it's not gonna change but it's there. And I think your technology, actually, Clarice, your technology is the way to find these and you will find a lot. We hope so. <laughs> oh, you're, time, you're just going to, so. I mean, we, we are going to realize with disgust how magnetically sensitive we really are. And a lot of what the body does, but so much of what the body does is respond to redox challenges. I mean, we, we, we spend so much effort maintaining our redox homeostasis. So when you throw in a bit of magnetic field effects, it doesn't really register. You know, it's, it's, oh, there's another little stress, which I will now respond to. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not easy. Unless you look for it, there's not going to be a phenotype. But they're there in so, cells. So, so I, I'm, if, if I may, and, and maybe I shouldn't start a discussion here, but um, I, I'm not sure what you mean by phenotype. Uh, and we see effects on magnetic fields, I mean, that, that do register somewhere, for example, like effects on proliferation rates of yeah, cells, okay. right? That's, effects that's on. Phenotype. Yeah, that, that I completely agree. That is a phenotype. For me, I, I am, a phenotype is a biological phenomenon. I mean, I, I have a very um, large view of phenotypes, you know? I mean, I, I think even this fluorescence of the mitochondrial enzymes is a phenotype. It may not be involved in something we care about very much, but it is a physiological effect. And, and Margaret, and beyond flavoproteins, which other family of proteins should we look for? Beyond flavoproteins, what, what, is there anything that should be susceptible to magnetic fields beyond flavoproteins? I, I would look for redox. You know, there's a, there's a lot of metals, metal binding proteins out there, undiscovered and undetected, happily doing their thing. And that's a perfect candidate. And I, there also, I, I would look for redox chemistry. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, and Daniel might correct me. I think that the problem with metals involved is that uh, is, is that superposition times uh, get reduced. Oh. Daniel, is that correct? I have no idea. Please answer that. Yes, this is correct. So most transition metals are associated with rather short spin relaxation times. So coherent phenomena cannot be cannot survive that. That, that easily, let's put it like that, which usually implies that uh, they're only sensitive to larger magnetic fields. Okay, which we are not interested in. Clearly. 
Well, so, so, I mean, I was wondering about this Mag R stuff. I'm, not that I think that's how cry does anything, but is there a kernel of truth in that, in, in that it might be another mechanism for generating magnetic field effects involving uh, a metal, some, some type of metal binding protein? Or is it just magnetite and forget it? I will you know abstain from about? answering that, Daniel. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. well, you know, you make R is even more controversial than anything that you have mentioned. Yeah, okay, so let's forget. <laughs> and, and, I, I mean, I, I don't I, I don't see evidence. I don't like to use the word believe. I see no evidence for the claims that are being made. Yeah, yeah. I, I so, would put it so, that way. So, so, so we, we are kind of approaching very thin ice here. Uh, yeah, but, okay. But yeah, well, so. I, well, I having read about Fenton reactions, you know, and innocently diving into the redox literature, I thought anything that will generate reactive oxygen intermediates are candidate radically radical pair reactions. Maybe there's some, you know, maybe not right at the metal core, but they might have some more far-reaching um, impact. Yes, yes, I, I agree on that. So the, the, the problem certainly with, with all these reactive oxygen species is that they too are very quickly uh, spin relaxing. But, yeah, I liked your talk. Uh, I agree, but let's let's keep that open in case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. I, 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 I you, 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 you know, yourself uh, talked about scavengers, I've, and I yes, think yes, that yes, is I, the I, I have, have suggested quite a few mechanisms of how to work around that. Uh, so it's it's a question of proving one. Yes, exactly. Please, please do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can help. Folks, I think I, I, I really like talking to M M Margaret and, and Daniel are two of my favorite people. So I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing both of you in person next week. Thank you very much for contributing to those lectures, but I think we need to, to do the, the, the small groups. Uh, if you're around, uh, if, if, please feel free to, to jump across uh, I have to. breakout rooms.